Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition, an exploding edition of Jim Cornette's drive through right here, wherever you are on this beautiful Tuesday. I am the great Brian Last, your host, and it's my pleasure to be with you once again. And of course, the man who's going to be doing so much today. There's so much he needs to catch us up on, of course, including the review of AEW Revolution. And we get your questions also here on the show. But here he is, the star of the drive through Mr. Jim Quinn. Oh, oh, shoot that thing. <laughs> just shoot up here amongst us because one of us needs some relief. That intro you just did, Great Brian Last, Hawaiian Brian, O Podcasting Lion, was almost as long and interminable as the time that Gallows and Anderson spent when they went home too early trying to keep on Moxley so that he wouldn't be able to leave the ring before it blew up in a cacophony of Gilberg sparklers. But we'll talk about that later. <laughs> How, are you? How are you? I'm good, actually. It, it's, it is to laugh at this point. Um, I, I hate so many times I've said this before, and, and the folks, the people out there, the cult of Cornette, they know it's genuine. I hate it when I keep being right. I hate it when I'm constantly correct. But I, we're, we're going to have some evidence of that also if, if, if this case needed any further prosecution before the verdict was rendered. It don't take Stephen P. New to try this one in court, say that these people have no concept of what they're doing. I don't know how the AEW brain trust finds its way home at night. I tell them what's going to happen on their own programs weeks before it does, in public, if you will. And they still don't believe me. And then it happens. Anyway, you should add to uh, my introduction, Brian. I am now the Count of Cameo. Uh, is that what you're calling yourself now? I don't know. I the just Count of up. Cameo. Just, the Count of Cameo. <laughs> <laughs> Let's count to 50. It, it, One, I, two, I, I, three, I'm 64. The, I'm not the consigliere of Cameo. But anyway, and I, I've already had to cuss one son of a bitch out. By email, I'll have you know. I'll just I'll just have you know. Because he accused me of, of prevarication, malfeasance, fornication, and and outright and out uh, out and out fraud. Here's what happened with the cam, and thank you everybody who got in. And I have not shot them yet. As we speak now, as we record this program, the cameos went on sale yesterday, March the 7th at, at noon Eastern. And so Hotchkiss Featherbottom is coming over on with all the equipment on Thursday, and we're going to shoot these things, and the folks will shoot that thing. We're going to shoot all these things, and the folks will have them. Uh, I guess when you upload it, it's fairly instantaneous. Where this, It's all a learning process here. It's a work in progress. We're all doing this for the first time. But anyway, that's what's going to happen. So everybody that got in <clears throat> will be able to, um, will be getting their cameos by, I guess, Friday, Thursday night, if we do them on Thursday. Um, stay tuned, folks. But one guy sent me a nasty email because here's what happened. And this, I apparently set another record. Cameo has, has plenty of server. I didn't crash them. But I set another kind of record and was able to find out of a feature of theirs that doesn't work under duress. I, I haven't even told have I told you about this yet? No. We haven't even talked. We haven't talked since this. Okay, well, what happened was we were gonna go up on Sunday at noon, right? With everything. The profile wasn't even up to say that I was unavailable. We just said we'll just debut. And then I started thinking, I was, wait a minute now, we're trying to do something brand new on a Sunday at noon Eastern where the folks that have been helping us out at cameo are, it'd be a Sunday morning at like 11 o'clock. They're on central time. I said, I told Hotchkiss, I said, let's get the profile up on Friday and, and, and just say that I'm unavailable. And that way, at least we know that works. So if we need help from their end, see, I'm, I'm thinning, I'm on top of this stuff. Right? So he gets the profile up on, on Friday. And at the time, the uh, the cab Jack from Cameo has been just a wonderful, wonderful uh, aid in all of this. And 
And uh, he, they uh, agreed to talk the next day because Jack said, hey, I can, uh, I can set this automatically for you so you don't have to watch it manually. And when 50 are sold, switch it off yourself. We can just, the, 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 the phrase they used was throttle it. And somebody almost got throttled over this, but throttle it to where only 50 are available. When they start buying them, they'll cut it off at 50. Well, that's just, that's wonderful. Well, that's just swell, right? So when they speak on Saturday and and Jack makes the uh, adjustments, they hang up the phone. And what Jack has also done is accidentally put me up live. And now there's a, a goddamn, there's a, I shouldn't say goddamn with our fine partners at Cameo here, but there's a feature on Cameo also. If you go to my profile on Cameo at C-A-M-E-O, Cameo.com, slash Jim Cornette, you can click on a thing. If I'm unavailable, it says send me an email when he's available. So people between Friday and Saturday had already done that. It, it, you see it, 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 the number was increasing. Apparently, when they put me on live on Saturday afternoon accidentally, people started getting an email, and they sold like seven because Hotchkiss has the phone next to him, right? And it was sort of like the spooky phone that Bobby Eaton had in his room at that hotel in Chicago. It was just, it was no light, and my and mine too. You couldn't fucking there was no light, no dial. You couldn't get a dial tone. Any then suddenly it rings. Hotchkiss is sitting there with the phone and he gets a notification. Bing! And then bing! And then bing! And he's like, what the fuck? This is not hooked up to anything yet. We don't even have a phone plan. And he looks and it's selling cameos. And he immediately calls Jack back and says, Jack, what the fuck? Oh, shit. And it, so they sold seven cameos in a matter of time. It took him to call Jack back and figure out what happened and they took it off. So then... At 11.59 a.m. on uh, Eastern Time on Sunday, Hotchkiss sets the profile to available, and bing, 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 and he's like, oh, this is great, and bing, 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 and he's like, great, and it keeps binging, it keeps binging, and finally it's getting to the point where he's thinking that the binging will come to an end because the throttle will shut this off, right? Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> whoa, ho, ho. Now he's got to get the goddamn thing and get on the boom, boom, boom. And he's cuts it off. And by that point, it was 64. Because apparently, in in uh, reconvening with Jack over this, they, they had so many people at the same exact time getting in there, trying to get in there, already in there, whatever the case may be, that it, it throttled their throttle. And and they're gonna have to go back and look at this. So I'm helping Cameo out, figure out the bugs in their in their system. But anyway, oh, thank you everybody. It was that was thrilling. And like I said, we're gonna shoot them on Thursday. And uh, once that everybody gets them, and and we've made sure that because didn't Jerry Seinfeld say that one time, Brian? It's not the taking of the reservation; it's the holding. That's right of the reservation. Well, in this case, it's not the taking of the cameo orders it's the filling of the cameo orders so if this all works out smoothly then we're going to schedule a day uh that we will do this again and we'll it will keep you updated so i get the experience we will record after thursday so updates on cameo on the experience if i make it through and i don't have an aneurysm and speaking of an aneurysms i've been mentioning for quite some time now that uh, Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com would reopen for business with all of our fine merchandise this coming Sunday, March 14th, including the brand new restock of the last run of the original Jim Cornette action figures and the Christmas variant. And uh, we're still waiting on the boat, as last I've heard, because I, and this is not a rib. They are on a slow boat from China. And... I was contacted, as was the toy company, at the end of January, saying that the ship is is on the water and will be docking by the end of February, which is why that we set an on-sale date of March 14. And I have heard, since now we're, what, March 8th now? is it, I've not heard that that ship has docked. I've mentioned Somali pirates, 
If you see any Somalian websites with Jim Cornette action figures, please do not patronize these people. But the, the store will reopen on Sunday, March 14th, and it will either have a banner on the front page that says, hey, action figures now available, or it'll have a banner on the front page that says, hey, the boat's not docked yet. So tune in to jimcornette.com, even if you don't want to buy anything, just to see how I'll be shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds. If that banner is up and says, hey, the boat ain't docked yet. Just, just tune in on Sunday, March 14th. Tune in, log on, turn on and drop out at jimcornette.com on Sunday, March 14th. I was going to jump in before. I wish you would. We have such a packed show. I want to make sure we get this in now. You know, it has been a recent sensation with people buying cameos for you. Yes. Mr. Jim Cornette, the Count of Cameo. We'll work on that. That's a work, working title. We'll working work on title that. productions. And one of the recent cameos we played on the drive-thru last week was a wrestler named Danhausen, who had a very unique way of talking. You didn't get to see the visual of what he looked like. As I said on the show, he kind of had a Swedish death metal kind of look. I have I have seen pictures now, since then on 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 the interwebs of of Danhausen. Again, I've never seen him wrestle, so I have no idea how he actually works. But I must admit, his cameos crack me up. <coughs> Pretty funny, and we're kind of at that stage in wrestling where you're gonna need to find things to laugh at. Because oh no, if that's not hard, yeah, that's the problem. And you can only laugh at that finish. Whether, whether, whether you're whether you're laughing at things on purpose or by accident, there there is the issue. Yeah, there were things during the AEW pay per view like the finish that you could just laugh and go, "Oh my god, this is hysterical!" For so many different reasons. So with that said, I'd like to see Dan Housen wrestle. I haven't yet, but his interviews seem to be really interesting. And now, based on our reaction. Last week, to his cameos, someone has purchased a cameo for you. Oh, no. From Danhausen. Oh, boy. Would you like to hear this? Oh, I guess we're going to. Here's Danhausen. Hello, yes, Danhausen here. <laughs> this is from Alexandros. Voros, okay. This is for wonderful fan housing. James Cronit. Okay, sounds familiar. Great James Cronit wants you to explain to him your gimmick. What the hell is that? Wants to know why you speak that way and what the gimmick, what the hell, is supposed to mean. Well, you want to know why Dan Housen speaks the way that Dan Housen does? Hmm? It's because people listen. You are listening now. They are listening now. And that makes Dan Housing powerful. You see, <laughs> when people listen, it gives you power. The power to get on television, like Dan Housing, who then makes all of the money. You see, the more televisions Dan Housing is on, the more money he makes and the more powerful he becomes. So, in order to get people to listen, Dan Housing has found a voice. Dan Housing will not go out there and say, hello, so-and-so. Time on Saturday, you mean? You see? Dan Housen is coming, you see, Saturday. To fight you in this match of some sort. No. Dan Housen will not take that route. Dan Housen will take the route of fame. By using his evil powers, but of course. Which can be interpreted any which way that you see fit. <laughs> It is up to you to decide what Dan Housen is. It is not up to Dan Housen. But, nevertheless, thank you for getting uh, Dan Housen paid to explain such things, <laughs> adding to his wonderful sack of money, going towards his house made of solid gold and rocket car of some sort. <laughs> and, uh, yes, have a nice day. Love that, Dan Housen. See you, bye. You know, we just complained about how wrestlers never talk about wanting the money. Wanting yes. to win and... Do these things so they get money. Here's Dan Housen explaining. <laughs> House of solid gold in a rocket car of some description. Oh, oh. Thank you. Uh, whoever it was that bought that and got Dan Housen paid for telling me about his gimmick. 
and that's great. Also, now the the burden the burden is on us to to figure out what his evil powers are. He has some, but we must figure it out. I like that. He appears to be in his garage, and he has a giant Nosferatu behind him <laughs> during it. So there's something going on there, but I get a kick out of it. I have to say, <laughs> I get a kick out of that Danhausen. Uh, he's Danhausen sounds like a brand of of slacks in the seventies, though, doesn't it? Get your brand new Danhausens <laughs> over at Men's Warehouse. Anyway, <clears throat> I got. I know this is your show. Do you mind if I just take over and do what I do best, which is be better than you? Anyway, I have no problem with that. Let me just say that was sent in by Alexandros. Alexandros. Why did? Do, why does everybody sound like a character from Nosferatu <laughs> that's involved in this? <laughs> and there's Alexandros, the vampire, coming. <laughs> It's a good point. It's a good All right, I'm going to uh, anyway, I'll take over here for a second. No, this is serious. We got a we got an email. I got one. This was not to the drive-through uh address, so I knew you wouldn't get it. But I thought we should share it. Uh from Donald. Uh said, "Dear Mr. Cornette, let me start by saying since discovering your podcast a little over 2 years ago, I've gained a new appreciation for a love of wrestling that had been waning. Modern wrestling still sucks, but at least I can look forward to you and Brian tearing it apart twice a week." Uh, wrestling has always been a bond I've shared with my family growing up, even my mother. I recently wore the thank you, fuck you, bye shirt to her, to her house before the holidays, and she fell in love with it. That was a perfect nod to mom's sense of humor. I ordered her one for Christmas, and she was ecstatic. When asked where it was from, I responded with, Jim Cornette, he's from wrestling. I listen to his podcast every week, and she replied, I remember him. <laughs> <laughs> the fat guy with the tennis racket that came out with the undertaker right <laughs> and uh anyway she said not quite or he says not quite mom but at least she tried right anyway she loved your shirt and wore it regularly even wanted another to wear as a night shirt and would love when i told her about your foreigner references which uh, I was in the classic rock category not people from other countries um, mom unfortunately became ill on January 28th and after a short stint in the hospital passed away on February 20th. We buried her last Monday and at the wake I was shocked and overjoyed to find this picture of her that my sister had taken and he sent me a link and it's a picture of this lady standing out in front of her house wearing the thank you fuck you buy t-shirt. Right anyway so he says if it's not too cliche tasteless or too much to ask, I was wondering if you could give Mama Joe one last thank you, fuck you, bye to wherever it is we go after this, and if nothing else, let this serve as proof that the cult is almighty and can reach and affect anybody, no matter their connection to the wrestling world. And she didn't believe in the guy in the sky either. Thank you, Donald. Well, Donald, we're sorry about your ma Mama Joe, and I can't I can't give her the, the T-Y-F-Y-B under these circumstances, but I'll, I'll thank her and, and fuck you for suggesting that. And we all say bye to mama Joe. How's that? Is that a, a decent, uh, compromise, Brian? I think it's fair enough. And like Jim said, we are sorry for your loss, but I got one more email from another cult member. It's got a more uplifting, um, tone to it and and really it's something that we ought to think about brian i think here on the show in establishing a program to help some people uh, uh tim uh, the subject of, of his email is youth program and tim says jim like you i'm worried about modern day wrestlers not knowing about what made wrestling great back in its heyday and eventually the people who could teach these gymnasts what should be done will age out and sadly pass away unfortunately the same is true for wrestling fans I don't know the demographics of your wonderful podcast, but I'd wager that they are people like me of a certain age that love and remember what the business used to be. We have more young people out there, though, than you realize, Tim, and that's why I think your suggestion is going to be especially helpful here. He says, so I would like to recommend you a youth mentorship program so you can educate the kids today. Oh, God. I, I know you already have a busy schedule, but as someone so passionate about the wrestling business, I believe you'll find time to make this work. I call it Cult of Cornet Kids, or Cock for short. As someone who has been so involved with developing young talents as a trainer and booker, I think you're exactly the person to show the world the cock. 
I know the cock may be hard at first, but if any man can keep the cock up, you're just the man to do it. Given your massive social media presence, you'll be great at showing the world your cock online. Anyway, I'm just the idea man. The cock is now in your hands. Thanks for my weekly hours of entertainment. Tim from Newark, New Jersey. What do you think, Brian? Should we should we mentor the youth, the young wrestling fans, as well as the young wrestlers to understand what it's supposed to be like with this this cult of cornet kids cock program? I think Tim should go right for AEW. What an awful email. <laughs> Silliness. Well, that's what we're here for, isn't it? Isn't everything supposed to be silly and fun? Newark, New Jersey. Stay there. Newark. All right, this is your show. What are we doing? Well, I think what we're doing, the main thing that so many people are going to be listening for here today, is reviewing a legendary pay-per-view event that has just taken place. The night where Tony Khan was officially Dixied, AEW Revolution. By the way, I do have an update from uh, last week's description, uh, the post-mortem we did of their television broadcast uh, with Shaquille O'Neal in the ambulance. Did you, did, you, did you see this online, on Twitter, whatever? I did. Um, one of Folks, for those of you who have anything in the world better to do than pay attention to what AEW has done, when they loaded Shaquille O'Neal in the ambulance after he took the table bump so they could get on Sports Center, and they closed the ambulance doors, I'd mentioned on the program at the time, I said JR jumped the, the pitch because Tony wasn't there yet because they hadn't done their magic. And when J- JR said, Well, we're going to get Tony, a word from Tony there, Tony wasn't there. And then suddenly they go to the beauty shot of the ceiling of the arena or the lights or whatever for 10 seconds. And they come back, and there's Tony, and he, op- he, of course, has the authority to open an ambulance door. He's an announcer. He can do anything. And Shaquille O'Neal is gone. He's disappeared, and there's actually an EMT in there that has to stand there and go, I don't know what happened. Like, he, this 7-foot, 365-pound man disappeared in front of my eyes. But that wasn't bad. That wasn't the worst part about it because we find out From one of the fan cameras, because everybody's got a camera now in their pocket, they put the video on Twitter. They actually, the ambulance was in sight of the fans when they closed the door on Shaq and then got the cameraman out of the way. They opened the door up and he jumped out and ran off and the people popped. He ran off with a striking looking athletic silver haired woman. Who seemed to be ready to celebrate with him? Did you see that? Yes. Well, I I, <laughs> I thought that might have been uh, Mrs. Same Face trying to switch promotions. <laughs> no, I it didn't... was Jade. Jade was there waiting for him. Oh, oh, okay. I couldn't. I didn't see that part. It was on Twitter. Um. Anyway, not only was this in front of the fans, but it was caught on video and put on Twitter. They couldn't even pull around the fucking corner. They couldn't stage the in a giant place with that few people in it. They could not stage that better than to for the people not to be able to just see it. And of course, some wise asses, the the people who are what they call wrestling fans today, but are actually fans of what they call wrestling today, not real wrestling fans. Uh, but some people on Twitter, but oh my gosh, shock! Wrestling's not real. But other people who have a more firm grip of the obvious and logic and common sense said, okay, then, how is that any different from on Broadway, the corpse in the mystery during a scene between the fucking detective and the fucking guy who was apprehended with a gun standing over the corpse, the corpse decides to get up and walk off on stage. Well, they're they're not done yet, but he's, he's bored. Or any fucking high school play that bothers to put a goddamn curtain up just to so that they're pretending to put on a professional show which is what is happening here they're pretending to put on a professional show but they're not even working as hard as kids in high school 
doesn't that even explain it to some of these numb nuts that still can't get over that everybody's supposed to know wrestling's not real? I ask you. I don't have an answer. <laughs> I've just browbeaten you into submission. It, it is a pretty impressive how quick they were able to get Shaq out of the ambulance right before the camera cut back to Tony. Well, no, it wasn't. They opened the door and he jumped out. <laughs> How's that? God, it wasn't like the ambulance was underwater and it was a fucking escape by goddamn Houdini. They opened the door and he jumped out. Other than any references made to him during the Cody match that I'm just not remembering, they didn't really talk about Shaq on the pay-per-view. Are they ever going to talk about what happened? What was the point of that? What was the point of doing he disappeared from the ambulance? I can't figure out for the life of me why do that. You know what? Well, I'll guarantee you. I'll tell you what it was right now, and I'll I'll dare somebody to prove me wrong. Shaquille O'Neal being just as big of a mark as the rest of them around there agreed to take the table bump if he could disappear out of the ambulance. I bet you that's it, because it makes no sense otherwise. So, because I mean, because it's it's a celebrity getting into wrestling and they, oh, I can do anything. It'll be fun. I'll disappear out of the ambulance. They'll get a hoot, and Jane will love it. Whatever the. <sighs> anyway, all right. And by the way, we I recorded the pre-show of. What did they call this thing? Revolution? Revolution. They called it revolting. But I recorded the pre-show and zipped through it because I did not want to hear these talking heads droning on about these inexplicable stories. But I did watch the entrance of the, you think we're far enough into this clip by now, the god of love and shit, or the no. queen of piss. 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 Piss and shit, or piss and love. No, love and piss. She would know she was the god of love and piss and the deity of shit. She was not the fucking lead uh, in her high school musical class, though. I can see Maki Ito. I can see why she got fired from her little Japanese idol show over there. She couldn't carry a tune if it had handles on it in a bushel basket. What was that? That was the surprise that got the biggest pop of the night, actually, I think, from those fans in attendance. She came out. I guess quarantine rules are no longer in order. They said she just flew in from Tokyo. And boy, are her arms tired. And she did her whole little song. And the people seemed to really be into it in that ironic way that AEW fans enjoy everything stupid that happens on that show. All 747 or whatever they allow in the amphitheater. I think it was over a thousand this time. Oh, well, Jiminy Christmas. Yeah, things are loosening now. I don't know if you can tell, but, but uh, with the paid fans downstairs at ringside, they're, they're the reaction I think you're hearing in a lot of cases. And, and But w once again, was that good singing and I just suddenly went deaf? No. I know if you get COVID, you you lose your sense of smell. Did I lose my sense of hearing? I'm pretty sure it was bad singing. And why would anyone want her to do that on their television? Because it's silly and it's fun and wrestling silly and fun and things to laugh at. All righty then. She made me really respect the seriousness of Riho. <laughs> Uh, At one point right, during anyway. the match, she did a whole thing where she pretended to cry. What? Yeah, I can't even explain it. It was just like all of a sudden, I don't even remember what the spot was, but she was in such pain, she pretended like she was crying. I mean, I say pretend, but she was like acting like she's really crying like a child. I don't know how to explain it. She was awful in the ring. You didn't watch the match. I watched the match. Uh, well, why? Why did you do that? Because I was watching it live. I didn't fast forward through anything. I kept it oh, all on good live. Lord. No, no. Oh, hell no. <laughs> oh, hell no. If I'd have watched this live, I would have gone out of my fucking mind. Well, as I said, she's horrible in the ring. And someone well, also said, oh, she's great. She's the Joshi Princess Jello champion or whatever the fuck it is. 
but <laughs> not good at all in the ring. <laughs> I think we've all, everybody that wants to just admit the facts to themselves have admitted, and and he has reinforced this in media interviews, that these girls are there simply because they're, even if they're not fetish objects as I claim, they're old friends from outlaw wrestling promotions of Twinkle Toes, Harpo, Finger Bang, McFinger Fuck. And that's the only reason that they're being foisted off on us on television. It, but let's just face it. It, it. He's admitted that they're friends and he has scouted this division. I say it has to be some type of inescapable, irresistible fetish that he has for putting these Japanese girls that are not equipped to do any of this on in front of all of our eyeballs and just be the queen of piss and shit all over the wrestling business. Can you imagine his conversation with Triple H? Because he came out of it thinking yeah, Triple yeah, H yeah. really understood him and got along with him. Ah, and ah. Triple H is negotiating because Kenny Omega was a hot commodity at that time. And he says, we can give you all this money. And Kenny says, well, Tony said he'll make me executive vice president. And Triple H says, well, I'm executive vice president. We can't do that, but we can really compensate you. You will become very rich. And then Kenny says... You know, that's good for me, but here's one other thing. Let me know if you guys will do this, because Tony will. I want to bring in this whole troop of <laughs> female wrestlers. Now, I have the inside line to the last seven Joshi Princess champions, and I can get them all in here on the Royal Rumble. <laughs> and then Triple H hung up. And then he hung up. All right, let's get to the main part of the show. And poor JR, I felt bad for him. He sounded like he perked up a bit as the night went on, but his voice was bad at the beginning. He was the only bearable commentator the entire night. He sounded rough at the beginning. Like you said, he did get better as the show went on. I felt bad for the way he sounded. It couldn't be, you had to be in pain to sound like that. Your throat has to be hurting yeah, you. Yeah, oh, I can sympathize. Because remember a couple of years ago when I was doing those announcing gigs, every other podcast, I'd, my voice would be ripped. Because it's just, and it, if you can't get it out, it feels horrible. But he was pretty good. Excalibur is the most annoying commentator in all of wrestling. He is just, you always say it. I never Breaking say it. Breaking news. You always say, oh, he's such a mark. And I never really say that. But I'm going to say it. He's such a mark. And it's ridiculous. He's not, he's doing commentary for a small audience, not a big audience. But again, that's just maybe what AEW wants. Shivani, maybe it's time everyone starts reevaluating the whole Tony Shivani comeback project. I've always said that it's revisionist history pretending that he was any good in WCW after 1992 because he wasn't. And as the 90s went on, he got worse and worse and he went away. And a bunch of fans all of a sudden decided, I don't know how many of them were actually there when, you know, I don't know how many of them were watching Nitro. They decided, we want to have him come back. We missed the voice of Tony Schiavone. And for a while, it was all right. He has become unbearable on commentary. He just yells out wrestlers' names. But I'm going to argue with you here. It's Sting! I was like, okay, that's his thing. He stupidly yells out Sting's name like a child. Then on this one, it's, it's Hawk! What? Stop yelling out everyone's name. I actually, I thought he said it was Hawk. I'm like, they've got another Hawk, Ro Road Warrior Hawk, and it was Hook. But I, I'm going to argue with you here because the the mark that's paying him is telling him to do that shit. Because let's make up for the same thing with Justin Roberts. The the announcement, the ring introduction of of the CEO of Moxley Plumbing and Twinkle Toes was unbearable, and they're making up for the fact that one guy looks like a balding plumber and one guy is 61 years old or whatever was saying their name loud. But what can Tony say here? He grew up watching wrestling, and he got into business calling wrestling, and he was good at it in Crockett Promotions. And as you said, as WCW wore on and got more of a pain in the ass to, to, as a place to work and more outlandish and preposterous, and he got buried and moved down the thing, he got less interested in it. It seems like he, he didn't want to come back to wrestling. Now that he has, 
he's got to be thinking, what the fuck am I supposed to say about this shit? And, and, you know, he laughs at some of it like he's just happy to be there, but what can you say about this shit? He's never seen anything like this. I assume he didn't watch that much wrestling while he was gone. So now he has to be thinking either he's lost his mind or all these people are on fucking drugs, but how do you call it? He, he, nah, it's like, maybe it's Heenan like was you, right about him. What, say again now? Maybe Heenan was right about him. What did Bobby say? Bobby hated him. I'd, <laughs> I didn't even know that. Uh, well, nevertheless, um, however, having said that now, let's get this out of the way at the top. Anybody who's ever been a talent or a star or accomplished in some way in the wrestling business that agreed to be involved in this fucking promotion has just said to themselves, fuck it. Wrestling is the shits now, and I'm just going to overlook all this and take this guy's money. Because there's no other explanation. Because this, this was bad for them. I said it before. I did have that thought a few times during this event. You know, we've heard him from the beginning. The Dixie Carter, Tony Khan comparisons. comparisons. And, you know, I mean, with the Christian Cage signing, I mean, we'll get to that. And just so much of the schlock on this show and everyone just seemingly doing what they want to do. This is worse. This, this, is, is, this worse. is TNA. This is late era WCW slash TNA in terms of the actual content. Forget about what you think about the match quality of those are the matches you like. But this isn't good. And people well, more, more and more people need to start saying it. And more and more people are saying it. But there are still people pretending. But this isn't this good. This is worse than TNA. At least until Jeff was an out and, and was not involved, because at until that point, you has still had someone that knew the wrestling business, that had the final say, that made the decisions and controlled the fucking talent. And here there's none of that. So this is worse than than Dixie. Ever I mean, if it's this bad after a year and a half, imagine where it can go. Anyway. <clears throat> the tag team title match was up first, and I, until I saw the interview with Jericho and MJF about midway through and realized they've done this on purpose, I thought, these people are absolutely insane. They have done this completely backwards. And the, the, I said, there, there's no way, you. when I saw this match, I said, there's no way you can't tell me that they're going to waste, actually, the angle of juicing Papa Buck, and then just bury this fucking whole program in the first match. But then I realized that the whole program was this first and last match. They're not going to do this again. In which case they did waste <laughs> juicing Papa Buck for a one-off match to fucking, oh my God. Uh, it was MJF and Jericho against the dumb fucks. That's their new name now. Balding dumb fuck and pie face dumb fuck. I know you two will love that as well as you and Sharknado. Um, so after the rotten angle that they did, and I know it wasn't believable and his selling and acting as the kids say was abysmal and nobody believed it, but even just... To take up for it in story, after that, they just walk to the ring. Pie Face jumps out and kisses his wife. They do the in-ring intros with the maitre d' of Daly's place, Justin Roberts. Table near the front, please. Um, It was the most blasé entrance to, you guys just hospitalized our father that I've ever seen in wrestling. Wasn't it you? Yeah. Well, thank you for that incisive commentary. What about this? What about if in any other territory in wrestling, the babyface team had had their father attacked by the heels? The heels would come to the ring first. The baby faces music would play. The heels would be ready to looking down the aisleway. The baby faces would cross them up and they'd come in from the front door and jump in behind the heels. 
Of course, that's if all this stuff wasn't overdone for no reason every week on TV anyway. They would spin them around, bing, bing, bing. They'd start a four-way, a couple of backdrops, a couple of drop kicks. They'd spill out to both sides of the floor. One of the heels would get posted and get color right away. He's bleeding. They'd fucking rattle a couple of chairs around. They'd roll in the ring and fucking the baby faces would kick the heels' asses for three or four minutes. First one at the time and then both at the time. And then they'd pay it off again and do it again. And then the fucking heels would take over with a heat spot behind the referee's back and they'd get heat on one baby face until it was just time to make the fucking hot tag, which he would and the other baby face would make a comeback. Boom, boom, boom. Juice the second fucking heel. And as they're about to fucking win, the baby face get one good, strong false finish. And then the manager or someone else, or one of the heels pulls out a gimmick or does some kind of double fuck. Boom. Put the fucking belts on the heels. They're fucking staggering out, bleeding with the belts, and the baby faces still want revenge. You can get two or three rematches with building stipulations out of something like that, and the whole thing goes 12 minutes, and it's chaos in an orchestrated way. Or you can come out here and just like they did, the dumb fucks, they leg-dived the heels and rained, rained false, fake punches near their heads and then immediately rolled out to the floor for a sloppy fight with no bumps and then did a stage double-dive spot. And in this match especially, it, just, it took forever to start going anywhere, but none of the kicks or strikes had life or oomph. They were walking through it. Pie face and balding did all their same double team shit they always do. The match did make more sense than most of the Bucks matches because Jericho wasn't going to do a bunch of gymnastics and MJF and Jericho are both actually heels that can work, but there was no life to this. It just... Jericho and MJF, by the way, nailed the flapjack perfect, boys. Thank you for taking my advice. They were right in the right place where they should have been, positioned evenly and correctly. Um, Pie Face, at one point after they got heat on balding, Pie Face gets a tag and makes a stupid comeback that he obviously called, where he, he made a fucking comeback where MJF only took one bump somehow. He hit him a bunch of times, but he only took one bump. <clears throat> and then did you see the play? He ran... Pie face runs across the ring to hit the ropes, but Wardlow grabs the middle rope and pulls it down like three inches, and Jackson just flings himself through the ropes like that would have made any difference whatsoever. And he flew through, he dove head first through him. Uh, and then they got heat <laughs> on Pie face. And Remember when this whole fiasco of a promotion started, everybody liked referee Aubrey. She was so official and she didn't get buried and she had credibility. They're just treating her like every single one of these wet fucking dish rags. Um, Jericho and MGF went for another flapjack and Jericho, anybody that still has this thing on their DVR, possibly as evidence in a later civil suit. Um, Go back and watch. He, Jericho had just tagged in, and he fucking he just has to grab the guy and, and call a spot and tags MJF back in. They're going for the other flapjack that Pie Face can turn into a double DDT spot, and Jericho tells Pie Face a bedtime story in his ear. It all it needed to be was double DDT us. Jesus, he was down there for a day and a half. I think it's because he's gassed, and this was fairly sloppy. I think it's because Chris was gassed. Um. So he double DDTs both Jericho and MJF, and then he's already in the middle of the ring, pie face. And instead of going to the being disoriented and going to a neutral corner, instead of the heels starting to get up to their feet and closing in on him, the heels just laid there and pie face just rolled over and tagged his brother. And neither heel tried to stop him. Baldo made a bleh comeback, same shit as always. MJF took a great bump on the Canadian Destroyer, but it's still a completely ridiculous move. Um, 
And then they hit another false finish, a double team false finish on MJF. He kicked out again. So he kicked out of the Canadian destroyer. Then he kicks out of a double team. They're making the heels stronger than they are by hitting all these fucking moves. It's this psychology is so backwards with these people. Uh, then Matt threw more fake punches. Is it a thing now? Have they just decided that if the guy on the ground just covers up his head that you can just beat the shit out of his forearms and act like you're punching him and we don't care anymore that that's what it is? I don't know. Is that a, uh, did we get the memo on that? <laughs> I guess so. The, the, the dumb fucks went for the Meltzer driver on Jericho, but MJF grabbed Balding's foot and Jericho reversed pie face and tombstoned him. And as soon as he stood up from tombstone and the guy, Balding was back up on the apron and springboard flipped off the apron, off the top rope, into the ring and landed on his ass right in front of Chris Jericho, who was just staring at him. What was that supposed to be? I can't. I don't know. I watched that and I said, man, I wish I had this on my DVR so I could just rewind it and see this again. I don't know what that was supposed to be. Bad timing. Jericho immediately got the lion tamer. And I I mean, I've only, I've only been in and around the business for 46 years, but the only thing I could figure out was, and it's insane if they were going for this because it wouldn't work. And guess what? It didn't work. I guess they thought that Jericho could catch the guy's legs for the lion tamer when he flipped over the top and flipped toward Jericho. But no, no, you couldn't because his legs were going so fast and Jericho's just standing there looking at his boom and he was, it was done. It was like the Bubba saying, Jimmy, you fell so fast. And, <clears throat> anyway, Jericho gets a lion tamer and then balding buck in the lion tamer just tags pie face. So Jericho gets pie face in the lion tamer. The, Heels are out wrestling the baby faces in this grudge match where the baby faces or the heels bloodied and sodomized the baby faces father. Then MJF was gone for a while for minutes while Jericho did stuff with one of them. Then Jericho crotched himself in the buckle, but that it, he was going for the bulldog or whatever, and they were supposed to push him up, but he just crushed, uh, crotched himself in the buckle, and MJF is suddenly back there and tags himself in, and now Balding Buck is invisible and gone. And then it slows to a snail's pace as MJF taunts the little pie face on the ground, which you know is going to backfire on him, but it went so long. Jericho's on the floor laying there blown up. Then finally, the Bucks, of course, come back on MJF and go for the Meltzer driver, but Jericho foils it. MJF rolls Pie Face up, gets a two count. Jericho hits Pie Face with a baseball bat. And then, which by the way, boy, when I was a kid and you got hit with a baseball bat, it fucking hurt, whether it was at a wrestling match or at a fight or at a fucking playground or whatever, but they ain't making these bats like they ought to be getting these bats from Louisville. These ain't Louisville sluggers because these bats don't hurt anybody. Jericho hits this five foot eight, 190 pound middle-aged middle schooler with a baseball bat and MJF then immediately hits his finish and gets a two count. And this would not end. It kept going. And then finally, Jericho hit Wardlow by accident with the Judas effect. But the, since they were in a replay of another one of these preposterous false finishes, they missed most of it with the camera. Then they did a spot where the, the dumb fucks, MJF stood there and took and ping, got ping ponged by 10 super kicks. Four from each guy and then a double until he took one bump. This is what they're doing with the people that injured and hospitalized their father. They're doing Three Stooges comedy. 
And then finally they hit a shitty Meltzer driver on Jericho who probably wasn't anxious to take that fucking thing anyway. One, two, three. The, as I said, it's the exact opposite of what the match and result should have been if this was the start of a program that was being instituted that was called for by such a heinous angle. Um, but it's not the wrong result since this will be the last match in the program, but it still was the exact opposite of what the match really ought to have fucking been. Uh, and it was almost 25 minutes of this. And this was abysmal and had the stench of grisly death upon it. What'd you think, Brian? Well, first of all, did you see the interview with the Bucks that was part of like the package to show what led to the match? No, because I'd already seen all that I cared to see. It's too bad that Nick Jackson can't talk because they need someone other than Matt Jackson who just comes across like a little bitch, just like a little brat. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I was wait, watching wait, that wait, wait, wait. and I'm thinking, I'm watching that and I'm thinking, he's the baby face? We're supposed to sympathize with him here? Well, but, but wait, actually, he's appealing to his audience, a bunch of overaged, under mentally and physically developed whiny basement dwelling bitches identify with their own kind as far as the match goes you know it was all right as far as a young bucks match goes i don't like those matches where it's just spot 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 near fall near fall a bunch of flips and someone's gonna say oh come on there's so much deep storytelling in these matches no it's the same shit every time i don't like it but there are lots of young buck fans who do you know the buckaroos Lots of buckaroos who really like this, but it ju- it doesn't do it for me. And to your earlier point and to my overall point for a while now about Tony Khan doesn't know what he's doing as a booker. Their dad, and we could talk about the fact he's a douchebag in real life, but we're not even talking about that on air, on camera. We met the guy the week before. He put his hands on Jericho. We didn't actually even meet him. We just saw him in the we parking lot and there. shit and hanging around. Wearing the Disco Inferno shirt. Yeah. He put his hands on Jericho. So the next week, Jericho and MJF beat him up. He's in like a trance. <laughs> he just, he doesn't know how to sell this blood seemingly all over his hands and on his face and just random spots. <laughs> he had, wait a minute. He's religious? What do they call that? Stigmata? He started bleeding from his palm. I don't know what... <laughs> I don't I know just, what happened to the man. It's the, 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 the spirit compelled him! But obviously, this attack upset the Bucks enough that they jogged to the back to find him, and it upset them enough that one of them went in an ambulance with him. I hope he didn't disappear out of the ambulance. That tends to happen in AEW. And then they had a match against a team that doesn't look like they're going to be a team much longer. I mean, we'll see. And they won the match. They got revenge on the show before where they beat up the other members of the inner circle. This whole thing has been booked horribly. It was booked almost as if it was only booked to make the Bucks strong. Oh, you, you don't say. But what a waste. Imagine if, you know, again, take the real-life personalities and thoughts of Matt and Nick Massey out of the equation. And just a tag team called the Young Bucks. And there's a tag team called FTR. And everyone's been talking for years about who's the better tag team, who's this and that. I'm using FTR as an example here. And this team that you could have a long-term feud with beats up their dad. Remember, I mean, it was a big deal in San Francisco when Bob Roop went after Sullivan's dad. That, like, was the last big boost of business for Roy Shire. If it, someone's it, that's parents- it's, it's a strong, heinous angle. But what, what the 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 example you were just given, if it had been done with FTR, but it, you know what, it would have been wasted too because that program would have been cut off no, and disappear as well because nothing, they capitalize on nothing. They blow everything. They fucking throw it out there like shit on a plate with no, but plenty of forethought in their minds. They're just unfortunately very small minds that don't think well. They they think they're they think they're putting a lot of thought into this, but their thinning is pretty thin. And then it's gone. And then it and then there's no interest in it because of the bad finishes and the improper builds. 
Wasted. <laughs> Wasted. <laughs> what do you think about the old casino battle royal? I understand that when they had the casino battle royal, they were in Las Vegas. At e it was either all in or all out or double or nothing. Or, or to quote the great Lou Costello, craps, boxcars, big bennies, bye-bye. There was a casino <laughs> thief. What? What's the matter with you? I appreciate you quoting the great Lou Costello. Well, all right. But there was a casino theme <laughs> in Las Vegas or something. Now it's just a casino battle royal on a fucking show named Revolution in Jacksonville, Florida. I must have missed it. I'm, I'll be honest with you. This was one of those matches where I just couldn't pay too much attention. No, it's impossible. I knew it was a tag team battle royal. Was it actually called the Casino Battle Royal? Well, that's what I saw in advertising. Oh, okay. I didn't see the advertising for this match. Or I but this time, this, this time, they it was a tag team thing. So instead of groups of five people coming out when their card suit was pulled or whatever, it was goddamn... Uh, the, the team comes out like the Royal Rumble every such period of time or whatever. The point is, this is a mess. Every fucking jack leg outlaw goof that they've signed to a contract that they never even use on television, they just threw a bunch of shit out there, and it was an exhibition of outlaw substandard green talent having the worst example of indie bullshit battle royals. And it went well over 25 minutes. and whatever the fuck the purpose of this thing is, there is a battle royal on every show and it always exposes all of their people that they have that shouldn't be there. And the only part of this I watched, I, I, why it's a fucking mess, but I had to see it because somebody shared the clip on Twitter. Did you see the part where Dino douche, Dwarf Dong Sucker jumped in the ring and Dino Douche, he jumps up in Dino's arms and Dino throws him at Pizzeria Uno of the Dork Order, which now he's a goddamn baby face. So they got baby faces eliminating each other. The dwarf Hurricane Rana's supposedly Uno, but actually Uno was on the apron of the ring and just dropped the dwarf right straight to the floor practically on his head and then like two seconds later started running and ran 12 feet and went head first into the ring post and took a big bump to the floor that was a sprint he ran as fast as he could yes but he <laughs> had to wait for two to three seconds first after the move was given to him before he started so he made like an airline pilot he made it up in the air it's the most unprofessional bunch of horse shit i've ever why so basically people bought a pay-per-view that they're fast forwarding through because they can't fucking take this shit. Any comments about that match? That's all I saw of it. I thought the end with Ray Phoenix and jungle boy was really good. Well, I'm glad who won Ray Phoenix. Well, I'm so glad. it's Ray Phoenix and pack against the young bucks at some point in the future. Cause they already announced oh, it's going to be Ray Phoenix against Matt Jackson on dynamite. So, I thought the tag match was going to happen this week, but obviously it's at some point in the future. So how rotten do you think that will be? They just had, whether you, whether you realize this or not, MJF and Jericho are basically their top heel team because Jericho's their biggest star and MJF has been the, only bright spot on the heel side in terms of, well, it Starks verbally at least <laughs> they got they just had a pay-per-view match and and beat them and blew that off and they're gonna follow that up with the bucks versus felix and pack like if you went to i don't know anywhere in the united states of america and said name wrestlers Felix and pack would both be down around number 742 of anybody that would be mentioned so uh, they're following a big match with jericho and mjf up with bucks versus pack and felix all right for all the buckaroos that like high spots it'll be for exactly the what they want 
<sighs> Who else? I mean, that was the thing I was thinking at the end there. I was like, you know what? I think Jungle Boy may win this thing. He's always losing out at the last second to something. Maybe this will be the interesting thing. The Bucks versus Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy. Something different. Something we haven't seen before. But no, Jungle Boy lost. Ray Phoenix won. And Ray Phoenix, I'll say it again, he misses some stuff. He dives past people. But what a just spectacular <laughs> high-flying wrestler he is. What a spectacular high-flying misser he is. <laughs> They're always spectacular. When he misses, he misses spectacularly. No one else looks as good missing these moves or flying past people. Or flying. I've seen him do that spot where he dives through the ropes and he does a flip and he lands like in the crowd. I've seen him do that a number of times. Yes. But he's and, pretty and impressive. Somebody's going to call Stephen P. New one of these <laughs> days. Say, hey, this fucking Mexican just kicked my fucking teeth out. Not until they get rid of the hired help at ringside. None of those people Jesus are going to sue. Christ. Jay Cargill was at ringside. Did you see her? Oh, I, I know. I saw that. Yes. And Red Velvet on the other side. So that, <laughs> that's, well, of course, you know, back in the day, Trish Stratus, uh, you know, would, and, and Victoria would be on the front row cheering on the competitors in between their matches for the women's title. Whatever. Jay Cargill had her big debut. Now she's back to being a fan at ringside. Yeah. Well, at least she looks more natural there. She looks much more at home there. Uh, and by the way, for all the spectacular missers out there, uh, if you want to get a job with a real company, Pinocchio, there's only one left, apparently. And uh, yes, the programs do suck, but the WWE, I can promise you, you go do sloppy bullshit trying to get all your shit in at a tryout there and you're fucked. And for 20 years, I had to tell guys at every training program that I was involved in, I want a... Degree of difficulty of five and an execution of 10, not the other way around. You're not going to get a job that way. You're going to get fucking the reputation of being a fucking goof. And they've completely lost the fact of until you can make everything you do look good, don't bypass the basics. And it's more important for the shit to look real than for the shit to look exciting we're fucking, oh, holy shit. Because that's not what we're doing. None of, these, none of these people would have the discipline to play on a professional sports team because they all want to do what they like to do rather than what the fucking game is about. And the, any self-respecting coach of a professional sports team, if they violated the fucking fundamentals of that sport like these fucking jack-offs do in AEW, the coach would be beating him over the head with a fucking brick. Anyway, and speaking of which, talking about uh, uh, doing complete injustice to a great talent, Dasha's back there with Paul White about the big signing. And Paul White is uh, the big signing by the big show. Paul White is very smooth. He talks well. He's glib, etc. But he obviously was told to say this. So it was flat and it's stupid. He said, as the clue, I don't think anyone here can outwork him. What the fuck does that mean to the average person? He's got a great work ethic. They're just speaking to not even smart fans, but smart marks. He's always on time. He brings his lunch. Yes, that's, 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 that's impressive to the average person. He's always on time. He brings his lunch. He cleans up after himself. Nobody here can outwork him. That's what that sounds like to anybody besides their little bubble of basement nerd fucking titty sucking wrestling fans, supposed wrestling fans. What would that mean in any kind of real sports environment, and why would it be a provocative statement or a statement made to glorify the greatness of somebody? They've already said he's Hall of Fame worthy. Now he can outwork him, outwork anybody. He stays late. He never asks for overtime. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, should we? Well, let's jump ahead <laughs> since we're talking about hey, this because they did. Go ahead. What? I was going to say, we didn't even, I don't think we mentioned it, but curious your thoughts. Uh, Paul White, formerly The Big Show, when he came out on AEW Dynamite to announce that he has an announcement at Revolution, 
his T-shirt, I guess the branding, the uh, merchandise is going to be, what was it? No more BS. No more BS. What'd you think of that? Well, that is kind of a cute little play on on his name situation, isn't it? Um, it's not bad. You know, but <sighs> there's there's other... <laughs> that was probably his idea. The only witty thing about this whole presentation, they've buried... Big Show, I, I got to call him Show. I've known him 20 years to call him Show. They buried Show, and they buried poor Christian. And we're going to jump ahead to the reveal of the signing. Yes, it's Christian Cage. They did it later on in the program in another rotten way. Okay, as soon as they came out and had Big Show, Paul White, say a Hall of Fame worthy, worthy talent is being signed, everybody starts, is it CM Punk? Is it Kurt Angle? Is it this guy? Is it that guy? But only a few names, because there ain't that many guys out there that they would be wondering about. Which did a disservice to both guys. When it, and I like Christian, and I think Christian's a hell of a talent. And I think he looks in great shape, and I'm glad he's back in the business. But when you build that level of expectation and people start fantasizing about who it might be, it's never as good as who they fantasize that it might be. Because in their fantasies, it can be anybody. But really, it can't. It can only be who's willing. And CM Punk wasn't willing. So you've buried Big Show with over-promising something. And again, that's not to disrespect Christian as a talent, but it, he hadn't even been in the ring in five years except for one WWE pay-per-view that nobody's looking at anymore. So he hasn't been in people's mind and on people's radar, and he's not freshly over. He's not coming off some kind of hot run to where this could be this big game changer, which is what they put in people's minds that it was going to be. If they had introduced him in any other way, it would have been more beneficial to him because then it created an expectation he couldn't live up to. And whether or not that the hand-picked and or hand-paid fans in Daly's place cheered it or not, it was a letdown because the ex expectation people had built up. And then not only does the fucking entrance, his name pops up on the screen before the people see him and blow the surprise. He comes out to entrance music, gets in the ring, signs his contract, and leaves without saying a word. Is that what I saw? Did I miss something? That's exactly what you saw. So now Big Show is a, a salesman that overpromises and underdelivers. And the next time, if there is one that they really do have a shocking surprise that could draw them a rating, chances are nobody's going to believe it. So this was a, a good win-win for everybody. Like you said, everyone's mind immediately went to Brock Lesnar, CM Punk, to the point where he had to deny it. That's what I saw Brock, I saw Punk, I saw Lesnar. Kurt Angle. And, and Kurt Angle. That quality of names, and this is not meant as a shot at Christian, but he's not at that level. No, well, no, and it's not even his, he hasn't been in the business, he hasn't, he hadn't put out a record in years, so why should he suddenly be back on the radio with no explanation? Well, you can do that if you're Paul McCartney. <laughs> you can't no, do that I mean, if you're just anybody, but I think this is where a lot of people's mind, at least me, I thought about TNA. I hate to say it, yeah. where they, at that time, Christian was kind of, he was younger, and people kind of thought he was misused by WWE. Here's the opportunity for Christian Cage to be pushed as a main guy, and, you know, to me, it just didn't really work. He's not, he's good in the ring. I don't see him at that level, and I don't know how they're going to use him here, and I think the bigger issue, too, is that now you're getting to a point where it seems like you're just taking anyone who was a star on WWE TV. Matt Hardy. Well, Miro Miro pretty much put the exclamation point to that. Well, the Big Show and Christian back-to-back -back kind of puts the exclamation point on that. Because Big Show's a, a star, obviously, 
I don't know what he's going to be doing there. Christian was a name. No, I'm saying taking anybody. Miro is an example of taking anybody that's been on WWE television. At least Christian was a name. At least show was a name. At least Jericho was a name. Dean Ambrose was a name. I don't know what the, if you know, somebody said Moxley had said, this was a quote to the WWE. I had a bunch of ideas. They just good ideas. They wouldn't go for now that I'm seeing them. I'm not surprised, but I agree what you're, it's just, that's the Monday night war. Didn't get kicked off by one company taking guys that the other company either wasn't using or didn't care to keep. It got kicked off by taking the top, top guys. If you can't do that, find your own, for fuck's sake. And Try again, to- I brought this up the other day. Unless there's some cuts that we don't know about, and there are some people we haven't seen in a little while, but they've only added to the roster, and they haven't taken anyone away. So they just have a ton of guys, the majority of which nobody cares about. And you're just throwing more guys into that. I don't know. I don't think... (sighs) Just like football and soccer, I don't think Tony Khan knows how to build a roster. Well, speaking of which, up next, the women's championship match. I tried, Brian, because I I didn't want you to get mad at me again. Oh, give her a chance. She does not a schoolgirl. I wouldn't have gotten mad at you for this one. Oh, okay. Well, I just, well, it, believe me, I, I didn't watch the whole thing, but it was Hikaru Shida against Rio de Janeiro. What's her name? Not Rio, but another Rio from uh, Rio Miz, Miz, Mizunami, Mizunami. I forget her last name. I don't know. I guarantee you old Rio Mizunami has a hairball in her stomach the size of a large house cat. I'm just going to say that. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> I wait and I give these people a chance to impress me, right? You say, you say, don't skip the girls' matches, the Japanese Joshi. So I give them a chance to impress me. Within two minutes, Shida was standing in the corner Tensed up and stock still while Rio, not Rio, but Rio, was running in place while giving her fake overhand chops. And then Rio turned into a mime and started pulling a fake rope across the ring while Sheeta, the women's champion, was selling the fake chops in the corner. And that's when. I saw the fake rope and I used the real fast forward button because this was some embarrassing shit right here. And apparently this went on for the better part of 15 minutes forever. until it went on forever. Sheeta tried a suplex, but they both fell over in a heap and the announcers tried to act like she meant to do it. And then Sheeta came running and hit a knee strike with all 102 of her pounds behind it and got a two count. So got up and hit a shittier looking knee and got the three count. What happened in the middle of the, those things that I missed? I'm not going to go blow by blow through this match. This was the match where I tweeted out that so far, this is the worst pay-per-view AEW has ever done because everything has been awful so far. This was the bottoming out of this show. I agree with you. I, I thought it was embarrassing and it was stupid. Those chops in the corner and the fake rope. Twinkle Toes is convinced that this weird, quirky, niche, uh, Japanese culture stuff is going to get over here because he's a fucking, what do they call them, dweebs or whatever the fuck. He's the anime fucking video game dweeb or nerd or fucking jack off, in my opinion, fucking goddamn with his fucking middle finger up his asshole and his fucking index finger up his nose. Uh, But he thinks that people are going to like that shit. And that's why we have to look at this. During this match, they did it, I think, during the Riho match and maybe one of the other matches, and I'm sick of it, just the spot where they trade back and forth in the middle of the ring forearms or punches, and it's just always so stupid. This wasn't good. This was really bad. I don't know why anyone would care about any of this. 
But, you know, it's it's the same thing as Maki Ito coming out and getting a big pop. Like, these aren't the TV tapings they were doing in the South where they got 2,000 people, and these are, like, the AEW super fans that went to Jacksonville for this pay-per-view event. They already know who these idiots are. They pop for these idiots when they first come out because they're aware of them. If Danhausen showed up, they would pop for Danhausen because they're aware of him. And maybe that's the audience for these Joshi Princess matches, but this wasn't good at all. The AEW women's division, despite having a superstar like Jade Cargill, is awful. This whole division sucks. It's one of the worst things on almost every so, show. Serena, Serena Deeb just had knee surgery, and Thunder Rosa was here. But uh, yeah, she ran off all the heels. You will that okay? I'll coming out thing, after after fucking what you hoogie beats fucking what you hoogie. Here comes Nyla Rose and Vicky Guerrero, and they beat up Rio, but Sheeta makes the save from Nyla Rose with one forearm, which I guess makes sense because Nyla Rose's job to every midget girl on the roster, a third of her size, and then Maki Shit God and Britt Baker and Reba on crutches came in and tried to get some rotten heat, and here comes Thunder Rosa, one girl against five or however many and the heels just all ran off and oh good lord I, I it was like they just pulled the fire alarm and everybody oh shit we gotta go yeah and again thunder rose is great serena deep is great Britt baker has gotten a lot better in the ring and at least she has some personality but by and large this division is awful it made me appreciate riho seeing this match because <laughs> i realized despite the fact that she's tiny she is better as an actual wrestler than these other Japanese girls they brought over. Yeah, but that's like saying the fart you have from Arby's is not as bad as the fart you have from Taco Bell. You see, I don't eat at Arby's or Taco Bell. Well, I'm just saying and anybody, that's the point. not you particularly. That's the point. I don't go to Arby's and I don't go to Taco Bell and I don't want to. So you're saying that none of these girls on the AEW roster make you want to eat them? I didn't say that. I'm not going to sit here and start going down a list of women. If you're not going to start going down a <laughs> list of women. That's not, that's not what I said. All right, moving on. Um, so we were going to be, we were going to be treated to the exciting tag team grudge match of Miro and Pip Sabian against Chucklefuck the Butler Taylor and Pockets. But this was marred by treachery on the heels part. They go back for an interview. And of course, there's Marvez, Officer Bar Brady. And he asked the question. And before either Chucklefuck or Pockets can speak, they're jumped in the hallway backstage. They're not kidnapped now, but they are assaulted. So it happened again by Miro and Pip Sabian. And what was your opinion? They run Taylor headfirst through a glass window in a door. What was your opinion of that? Was that gimmick glass or not? I assumed it was, but I don't know. Here's what I think happened in my erstwhile and learned and experienced opinion. Door glass don't break like that in these buildings. That was gimmick glass, and he went down immediately like he was getting juice. But the idiot cut him, his arm on the gimmick glass when he went through it and blocked his head worse than he cut his head when he tried to get juice, and it ended up he had no blood on his face where he tried to get it, but he fucking accidentally cut his arm open because the fucking gimmick glass didn't work with him. So this was fucked up before they even got in the ring. And also, they let the jobbers get color, but not the grudge tag team title match on first. Nobody in that bled, but they can let the job guys get, get color, and then they've also got an exploding fucking goof match coming up. Anyway, so the heels just get rid of pockets, and he's nowhere, and he's nowhere for minutes. And they drag Chuck onto the stage and toss him in the ring, and Miro cuts an unintelligible promo, and Chuck says, bring the bell. 
so that they can have an official match because that means so much here. And they get to heat on Chuck. And as a matter of, as I said, by that point, his juice had dried up, so he can't even do that right. He, the only way he was, he was bleeding good from the arm, that was accidental. The shit that would have looked good, he couldn't fucking do it. I did note that I think this is the first time I've ever seen Pip Sabian try to wrestle. The Make-A-Wish program does so much good, Brian, for these young men. He reminds me of one of the first lines I ever heard when I got into business. He reminds me of the guy that would come up to you and say, Mr. Cornette, did you see my last match? And I'd say, son, I certainly hope so. So then Pockets comes stumbling out on the stage, falling and stumbling. He's all fucked up, but he reveals he was just playing Pockets. I mean, Possum. And he makes a comeback in quotation marks. Now Miro and Chucklefuck disappear and Pip and Pockets have the entire ring to themselves like two angry white nerds fighting over the last Pop-Tart. And both of them together have the combined weight of one grown man. So they do some shit for a while. Then Miro comes back. And and you'll find this is a theme in these AEW matches. And they're doing it in the WWE too. You just can't tell quite as obviously because their production is better. And also they don't have any fans in the audience. But these fuckers are just... It's like a concert where... Keith Richards decides he's going to have a four minute guitar solo and the rest of the stones just fucking bail around behind the goddamn drum kit and snort another line and they're gone. They're, they're having spots in these matches where guys will just roll out and just sit on the floor and just be gone and just not participate at all. So the people in the ring can have the spotlight. So pockets actually did the fake kicks to Miro. And then it just went on a pip was pushed into and knocked Penelope pit stop off the apron and Miro hit a sloppy something on pockets. And I, I, I don't know what the fuck's going on. And finally Miro got the camel clutch on Chuck and the baby face tapped out just, just to make it just as stupid as it could possibly be. The baby face tapped out. What the f- <sighs> Did I miss anything? No, I mean, he got the camel clutch. I thought, wow, they're doing a good job of making Miro look strong, and then he started going back and forth with Orange Cassidy. Well, yeah. Which was ridiculous. I got nothing else to add to this. I mean, I thought... What it was, Penelope Pit Stop took the best bump of the night when she went off the apron. Yeah, I thought she may have twisted her ankle the way she landed in those heels, but... I thought, you and I think very differently about Miro. I thought they've misused him from the beginning, that he had a lot of potential. There's a lot you could do with him. They haven't really shown that at all. They've gone the opposite direction, (laughs) actually. Because, no, he's being allowed to be himself, and he is obviously a complete fucking goof. He has no idea how to get over, no idea what got him over for a little while before in the other company. He does this stupid shit. And obviously is enjoying himself doing it. He was paired with a fucking a kid that looks like he's in middle school and his slutty girlfriend to have a feud with a guy that sticks his hands in his pockets and another guy looks like he cuts his hair with a pencil sharpener. Job guy underneath talent all the way. And he has embraced this instead of saying, No, Tony Khan, you make me top guy or I go fuck you and humble you. No, that's the Iron Sheik. But you know what I'm saying. But this he's a fucking idiot. Miro with his Minnie Mouse t-shirts. But here came the promo. So now we know we're going to do this next week. Jericho and MJF trying to make excuses for the loss in a backstage interview. And Jericho said we're going to have an inner circle war council this Wednesday on Dynamite. It's time to make some changes. And of course, then MJF does the dramatic foreshadowing. That's right. I'm firmly in favor of changes that need to be made. So they did this fucking angle. They fucking hospitalized Papa Buck. They have one match with these little clowns. 
And now they're going to pull the trigger on what we knew was going to happen all along, or we figure that. It's obviously been teased that MJF's going to Iggy Jericho out of the thing. But are they apparently going to do that this week already? Will it be a swerve? And what we think is going to happen, what we've all said is going to happen for months, isn't going to happen? But what else would make any sense? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> See, that's the thing. If they do swerve us, which they very well could, then it will be something that makes absolutely no fucking sense to have happened because they've led us to believe the other thing will take place. So that's a, that's a perfect swerve. Yeah, it doesn't have to make sense just as long as you didn't figure it out. And there's another example. I mean, Monday Night Raw ruined Chris Jericho mentally because everything he does is like a Raw skit. We're going to have a birthday party or whatever it was early on where that is dad in a box. We're going to have the dinner debonair. We're going to have a debate. We're going to have a fake press conference. We're going to have the war council. The war council won't be in a back room. It'll be in the ring in front of everybody. Everything's a bad raw segment with Jericho. Everything is what Vince McMahon wouldn't say yes to with Chris Jericho. There's a lot of people doing things now that they've been told for good reason in the past not to do. And uh, this is the place for it, apparently, since there is no leadership. Um, I hate that one of these guys lost so much money, but Adam Page wrestled Matt Hardy with their quarter one earnings at stake. I would think just for residuals and overall name value, I'd rather have Hardy's re- uh, quarter one than Page's, but nevertheless. Um, this started out as the closest thing that they'd had to a wrestling match so far, but then they, they go to the floor, they spend forever out there. The, the, it's that corpse referee knocks. So he's useless completely. Um, the heat on the hand kind of turned it into a snail's pace. Page was selling and then suddenly made a comeback instantly. Then he was fresh as a daisy, but then Hardy stopped him again. He got some more heat. They went back and forth. Page did the moonsault off the top again in every match. Uh, and he's going to fuck up and fucking hurt himself one of these days. It, it, this didn't, it didn't suck, and they worked hard, and they were serious about it, but it was just, eh. And then Private Party came out, but tried to get in the ring. One of them jumped in the ring and referee standing there and fucking page, you know, nails him back out and hits the other guy. And then Hardy hits his finish two count. And then suddenly here comes 18 dork orders and they help page beat Hardy. So they won't even let Adam page be a star without putting him in the middle of this ridiculous bunch of mass jack offs. It's, it and it looks so just so visually low rent and cheap and outlaw and, and it, there there's nobody here that that would turn your head as that guy looks like a star except page and and matt now because of his pedigree and you're clustering him up with private parties greener than goose shit the dork order is just ridiculous. They don't even spend any money on fucking dressing them up. It's just like they come out wearing whatever they came in from doing yard work in or whatever, and the masks are just generic. The fuck? It, that's what I saw. I don't know how anyone could care about this match or this feud. I didn't. I'm sick of the dark order again. And poor Matt has gone from from he he came in as Matt Hardy then he got broken then he got woken no he came in as broken he came in as broken then he got woken then he got fucking then he was regular him for a week Concussed after he got Matt. brain damage yeah. <laughs> and then he was a baby face and then now he's a fucking shyster con man cheating everybody out of their money in just a period of months it's just ridiculous it just because you can come out and change your personality every week doesn't mean that you should and with adam page i mean this is like trying to think who was on the rise it would be like you know 
all of a sudden The Rock joined the oddities. <laughs> you know, it's like what Adam Page has so much potential. Despite all the goofy, every interview he does, he's holding a drink or he's in the bar. Like it's just at this point, it's a it's a joke. It's just silly. But the Dark Order is ridiculous, and now they don't even have Anna J because she's injured. Oh, good lord! Who hurt her? Training. She got hurt training, from what I read. All righty then. Well, the next one was one of my personal favorites, and I'm sure it was one of yours. The six-man ladder match with the surprise entrant, who turned out not to be the big Hall of Fame-worthy talent, but yet another surprise entrant that nobody would ever heard of before. (sighs) Let me try to explain this for the people lucky enough not to have seen this exhibition. They had a ladder match. Between Lance Archer, who's a heel with his manager Jake Roberts, and Scorpio Sky, who's a babyface who hadn't been seen in months, uh, Cody, who's another babyface with his manager Arn Anderson, Penthouse, the one of the Lucha Brothers that's not Felix, Max Caster, the rap star, and the sixth entrant that they had milked was going to be a surprise, out comes All Ego Ethan Page. And everybody says, who? And they the best they could do is explain, well, he's been on Impact, which approximately one-ninth of the number of people who watch their national television show watch Impact. And this is not their TV show. This is a pay-per-view. So I guess, actually, whatever minute audience is watching this probably would know who All Ego Ethan Page is. But if anybody had bought this thing unawares expecting the big surprise. I expected the big Hall of Fame worthy surprise to be in this ladder match since they were milking an unknown individual. Did you not? Oh, I didn't expect that to be in this match. I thought it was just going to be someone with the big show. Well, why would they bill a surprise entrant and it be somebody over from a fucking outlaw show that nobody knows who the fuck he is? I can't explain and they, it. And he enters last after Cody? I don't, uh, so, you know, once again, they and they were acting like the people at home were going to shit themselves that this guy is in there. Um, but the latter match is for a TV title match. So you got, you got Paige as a heel on. Penthouse, we don't know whether he's a baby face or a heel. Cody's supposed to be a baby face. Sky's supposed to be a baby face. Archer's supposed to be a heel. Caster's supposed to be a heel. But it's six guys fighting each other at the same time with ladders. Basically fighting over getting a golden hemorrhoid pillow that's hung from the ceiling uh, to symbolize they get a shot at the TV title. And it's just, it's the same as all of them. You can't watch them, all these ladder matches. Uh, Harley needed a treat at one point, and I forgot about it for a while, but it's basically an amateur fantasy booker playing with real-life action figures, and he could write the names down. There's no Why were the six guys, unrelated people, having a ladder match? Uh, did you see the part where Lance Archer g- got knocked down and was in between the ladder, which was folded up on his back, and he stays there on his hands and knees? Actually, he... He didn't stay there. He pulled it and himself into the right spot and then stayed there on his hands and knees and watched Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky do spots around him for 22 seconds. I timed it. And then one of them powerbombed the other guy on top of Lance who was looking at them from his hands and knees. Did you see that? I did. And there's a GIF of that going around on Twitter. And I want to say to anyone who saw that GIF, it went on longer than that. Longer. Very long. Uh, Jack Evans and a masked Dark Order guy ran out and did a do si spot with a boombox for absolutely no reason. Uh, I fast-forwarded for a while. Then there was a spot where there was two ladders in the ring and two guys on top of each, and Scorpio Sky had it, but he wasn't supposed to win then, so he just didn't grab it. So I fast-forwarded some more. Archer knocked Scorpio Sky off the top rope through a ladder that was bridged from the apron 
to the railing and it broke and he went to the floor. I fast forwarded. Cody came back out from the back with people running after him. Apparently he had been taken to the back when I was fast forwarding and he was whipping people with his belt. And then Lance Archer superplexes Cody off the ladder. But that's not the finish because you got to grab the fucking thing. So he just took a superplex. And finally, Scorpio Sky grabbed the donut pillow. It was unwatchable. And here's why. I don't care whether a bunch of guys did a bunch of good moves or not. There was no logic to this. There was no flow. There's no baby faces. There's no heels. There's no heat. There's no comebacks. There's just tricks and stunts. And it's embarrassing. A word I've used and will continue to use in the future on this program today quite a bit. I was did I miss any redeeming quality? I don't know. I, I couldn't I couldn't watch this. I'm not a big fan of these matches. I like the first few we saw years ago. But then when it became With like an one annual ladder thing, and two guys. Well, and, not even the reason. But, but even when they started doing the tag team ones at WrestleMania with the Dudleys and Edge and Christian and the Hardys, I get you know like every year, oh, there's gonna be some crazy spot we've never seen before. But that was like twenty years ago. And now we've just seen it all over and over and over again. And the whole tease of, will Cody be able to get back in the match? Meanwhile, you see him and 40 trainers over in one of the tubes. I don't know. This didn't do it for me. But Scorpio Sky now gets a title shot at Darby Allen. Two baby faces. Well, I don't know. I mean, Scorpio, so maybe, <laughs> maybe he'll turn heel. Why is there a re why would you want to see Scorpio Sky beat Darby Allen for the title? Why do you want to see Darby Allen get beat? He's the underdog that everybody's supposed to love. Because he just won a giant brass ring. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is that is there any reason to do that except for the fact that Vince McMahon would tell guys you have to get that brass ring? No, it's all an inside joke. Uh, they did a package where they tried to make sense of why they're having a street fight uh, with Sting and Darby Allen against Team Taz after Sting and Darby Allen kicked the shit out of Team Taz for the past two or three weeks in a row. And then here we go. This is the cinematic movie that Sting always wanted to make. Remember when I said that everybody at the top of this show, I said everybody involved in this thing that's ever been a star or anybody accomplished in wrestling has just said, fuck it wrestling's dead it's it's shit it's over i'm taking this guy's money except for sting i think sting is got to be pissed that he never got to make movies like the wwf guys and this is his last chance because what <laughs> i don't even know where to start they did commentary over live commentary over a movie you know that the announcers and Taz joined them. His team was in the street fight, but he was there at the announce desk. And you know the announcers are live. But you also know that what you're looking at has to be taped because there's no way it can possibly be live unless everybody that was watching it's on acid. So when the announcers are talking about it, is it present tense? Is it past tense? At one point, Taz was cheering for one of the guys to get out of the way wouldn't he already know since it's obviously already been done it, it so the logic of the presentation and even what time warp we're in is suspect the the cinematic part of it it looks like it was shot by a wannabe director for an 80s mtv video it's like one of those deals where like Somebody in fucking first year film school, it doesn't matter whether the content makes any sense or not, or whether the performance is any good, as long as all the camera angles are cool. Uh, Darby Allen skateboarded to the street fight, and Sting was, at, you'd think, as one of the announcers said, I think it was Taz, Sting would be able to afford a better car, but it took forever for him to get there so they could have a bunch of cool skateboarding and driving scenes and then they started fighting their street fight in a fucking warehouse with a ring and 20 million people dressed like miniature darby druids 
and there were a lot of cool shots with a drone and overhead stuff. And as I said, somebody who apparently is a frustrated film school student, this, to me, this presentation, and the tooth and nail was abysmal because it was amateurish as, as well as phony. But this was even more egregious to me because the tooth and nail had a couple girl wrestlers in it. Let's just be honest. A couple of unknown fucking girl wrestlers. So it did, it deserved all the amateurishness that it, it was shot with production wise as well. But this contained at least one guy that was a major name in wrestling at one time. And so this, I, th I think that qualify and it was advertised as a main event on a pay-per-view, this thing. So I think this, this was worse. And this was basically an insult to anybody who's ever worked in professional wrestling that they would try to pass this off as a street fight and expect you to pay for it. And Sting beat Starks somehow. I don't care. Do you like it? Was it was it better on the on the pain? Are you still on your pain pills for your teeth? No, no, I'm out of those, unfortunately. Other than pharmaceutical grade ibuprofen, aka Motrin. So this didn't off. do any good for you on on watching this match either. And they, I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't hate it like you did though. I thought, I thought it was maybe the best cinematic match. I know that's a very low bar. That's, a, that's like being the nicest guy in prison. The Undertaker and AJ Styles was shot well and kind of like a movie, and once I saw it, I didn't want to see any more of them. And now this is all we're going to see. I like this better than Undertaker and AJ Styles. Uh... And boy, I'll tell you, for a guy... Did, who... you, did you hear Taz saying kick out to Starks? The whole commentary over it was ridiculous. It wasn't live. Everyone knew it wasn't live. I don't know why they decided to do that. Maybe to drown out some of the music. I'm really not sure. Well, and that's another thing. The, the music, the tense, spooky music and all the other sheds, it's obviously people cooperating with each other to film a movie instead of a wrestling match. And if I wanted to watch a fucking movie, I could have watched a fucking movie and not some cable access indie wrestling. I and thought it was just all right. insulting at this point. All things considered, what it was, I thought it was all right in the universe of cinematic matches. <laughs> Sting seems to be able to move pretty good in that ring. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? Well, I'm glad Sting can move well in the ring. I wonder how many hours it took to shoot the fucking three bumps that he took. That's it. It's cheating. That spot where they threw Darby into the glass thing and then he went down and then the board just crashed onto his head. I didn't even see that part. I think I was playing with Harley. I thought that was pretty cool, but I mean, there were silly elements of it, of course. But if you're going to do a cinematic match and I'm against it, but out of all the ones we've seen and there have been some amazingly bad ones in WWE that were embarrassing. Like, this isn't anywhere near as embarrassing as that swamp fight. I thought this may have been the best cinematic match of them all. Again, low bar, but got to be honest. Uh, how about that abortion where they fought up the, to the top of Titan Tower and then one guy fell off the roof? Was that cinematic or was that... I mean, do you... Well, it I consider anything where they're just shooting shit like a movie in separate scenes and not doing a continuous fight from beginning to end, whether in front of people or not, cinematic, and that's another word for cheating and another word for bullshit, and another word for fake, and another word for an offense against professional wrestling. If you consider that a cinematic hey, match, if, I if, would if still you, take when this you, one. When you, go to college, when you go to college and you take your final exam, are you allowed to bring the fucking answers in with you? Then in that case, there shouldn't be multiple takes of a fucking wrestling match. If you want to make movies... Start your own fucking movie studio, asshole. Oh, don't give Tony Khan any getting, ideas. Well, why not? I'm getting fucking hot, but let him <laughs> fuck somebody else's goddamn business up. For fuck's sake. <sighs> you know what I wanted to do about this time? No. Shave my balls. How's that for a segue, folks? I don't know any other way to say it. 
<laughs> after a long cold winter, you might have let your your natural sweater grow a little bit because you wanted to keep everything nice and warm and cozy. Well, now spring is springing. The sun's coming out. You need to clear the the swamp. You need to make sure that everything is groomed because you might have spring break. Now that with COVID is still this year, so you're not, the people who listen to this program are not going to go to Cabo San Lucas and slobber all over everybody in the middle of a pandemic. You're still going to be sensible about this. Therefore, you need to make sure that you're groomed just in case an opportunity comes to have COVID-free, guilt-free relations with another person. Spring break in your pants. Hey, it's a party in your <laughs> pants and everybody's coming. <laughs> Folks, whether it's the Perfect Package 3.0 kit with the Lawnmower 3.0 waterproof cordless body trimmer, the cutting edge ceramic blade reduces, eliminates grooming accidents, as they say, thanks to the advanced skin safe technology pioneered by Manscaped. You've got the Crop Cleanser Body Wash, you've got the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. It's anti chafing and moisturizing because, for heaven's sake, you don't want dry flakes down there. Oh my gosh, that would be incredible. And also the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. All of this and more available at manscaped.com. And if you go to manscaped.com and use the code DRIVE, D R I V E, you get 20% off and free shipping on anything at the site. Drive is the code. Manscaped.com is the destination. And Hawaiian Brian, if you use Manscaped, you can say aloha to your new beautiful shiny balls. I will take that under consideration. I'm but, glad to see that you're considering this seriously. But we still have a main event to talk about. By the way, at this point, we were three hours into this show. Four if you count the pre-show. And the CEO of Moxley Plumbing was still out in the parking lot three hours into the... That used to cost money. I wonder if it still does. Because from the time that we started doing pay-per-view with Crockett and then later on with WCW and with WWF and TNA and not the Ring of Honor pay-per-views because they were internet pay-per-view. That's what they... Sometimes they weren't on that. But with all the regular televised pay-per-view events you had a three-hour satellite window and that's why um the rule always used to be that the show would go and i, I know the in your houses were two hours but bear with me on this point is an even even amount of time you had a three-hour window on the pay-per-view the pay-per-view had to go off the air by 255 in because they needed five minutes to re-rack the replay and get it up at the top of the hour. And if you went long, they would charge you for another hour of satellite time. This fucking thing was almost four hours long, five if you count the pre-show, and goddamn the greatest cards in the history of wrestling weren't that long, and they had good matches from top to bottom. This was dreck. To begin with, and it was interminably long. Are they trying to punish people? So anyway, it's an exploding business death match. Killing the business with the CEO of Moxley Plumbing and the CEO of Twinkle Toes Theatrics. Did you see Harpo's cartoon drawing? I did. That was on Twitter the other day. The, the official company Twitter, by the way. Harpo Fingerbang did a cartoon crayon drawing of how deadly the, the the deadly plan for this exploding barbed wire death match with all the exploding bomb pits and the everything. It looked like something that a, a fucking nine year old would do at summer camp, and they tweeted it out as if to that would make. Can you imagine if Dusty had let Dustin, when he was 12, draw a picture of the War Games cage and they put it on TBS? 
So this is an exploding barbed wire death match. And to make it look even more goofy and unprofessional looking, the wrestlers decided to compete in their grubby street clothes while the referee was wearing a hazmat suit. I'm not making this up. Barbed wire boards in two corners of the ring, barbed wire wrapped around all the ropes, barbed wire boards around three sides of the ring, and Callus immediately on color referred to the explosions as effects before they'd hardly even started the thing yet. <sighs> Brian, I hate it when I'm right, but do you remember what I said about this a couple weeks ago? In fact, I do. And in fact, because I saw so many people on Twitter mention it, I actually pulled that audio. Oh, you well, well, that's why don't you just instead of me saying it again now after the fact, why don't you play what I said about this stupid idea for a match about two weeks ago, long before it took place? This is from Jim Cornette Experience, episode 369, approximately two and a half weeks ago or so. Here is the clip. They're fucking, it's stupid, it never works, it just looks low-rent and cheap and sideshowish <clears throat> and outlaw, and guys try to have garbage matches in the middle of this, and it doesn't fucking work. And I have high expectations that this is going to be a technical fiasco and another outlaw garbage match between two fucking guys that don't know how to work. That's pretty much my opinion on what's going to come up. We shall see, because we're going to watch this thing. I wouldn't miss it now. Maybe Harpo Finger Bang will get set on fire. We could watch him fucking melt. That would be worth the price of admission alone. And there it is, Jim, from Jim Cornette Experience 369. Can you find anything that I was incorrect about? Certainly it was deflating the <laughs> ending of that match <laughs> okay first of all the way this thing was set up i can buy the wire around the ring ropes right i've had i've been involved in i've booked barbed wire cage matches where people the barbed wire was around the ring so that you couldn't get out or nobody could get in except that wasn't what this was they just wrapped barbed wire around the ring ropes but it wasn't on one's, there was nothing on one side where the stage side was, so everybody could just get in and out freely. And if they didn't want to bother to go to the stage side, they could just drop down and roll out under the bottom rope. And the rest of it, barbed wire boards leaned up against the turnbuckles, the referee in the hazmat suit. Then on the stage, there's a garbage can with a barbed wire baseball bat in it and a kendo stick. And they've got a chair wrapped in barbed wire. And so they, when they started out, it looked like they might actually know what the fuck they were doing because they were milking using the wire and it somewhat made sense. And they, they were trying to push each other into it or whatever. This somehow made sense despite the fact that this is just so visually stupid that you you can't when you've already got a ring wrapped in barbed wire and barbed wire boards leaned up in it and barbed wire surrounding the ringside you've got to still have a barbed wire chair and a garbage can and a baseball bat and a blah 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 this isn't a hat on a hat it's a fucking you're wearing three suits one on top of another and then finally, they go out on the stage because you can leave the ring enclosed in deadly exploding barbed wire freely. Moxley gives old Harpo two little pussy shots with the baseball bat. So the big badass has a chance to hit this guy with a baseball bat and he pokes him in the gut and gives him another little shot. It's, it, now it's completely fake. Thank you for removing all doubt, balding plumber. Um... Harpo at one point blinded Moxley with powder and threw him into the wire so the effects could go off. 
And then they, they, you know, they started using all the gimmicks, whether it be the garbage can, the kendo stick, a chair wrapped in barbed wire, everything that's made pro wrestling look like shit and made people ashamed to be fans of it for the last 20 years, all in one match. So it's nice they had it all together. And then Moxley gets color. Um, so they're in the stupidest, fakest looking, most illogical, most visually comic parody of pro wrestling that you can really ever put on a big budget production and he's down there cutting himself to make it seem more real blood adds drama in a grudge wrestling match not a cartoon garbage parody then it's just well you're going to bleed anyway because you're rolling around in all this barbed wire of course i believe from what i could tell they were only using two-pronged barbed wire which makes it easier not to get caught up in the shit, but they're still cutting themselves, so they're fucking morons because they're rolling around in it and blowing off the effects. And then did you see fucking the the supposed baby face in this thing, Moxley? The baby face is always supposed to be smarter than the heel, right? The babyface wraps the barbed wire around his own arm just to clothesline Twinkle Toes. Now, meanwhile, there's a baseball bat laying five feet away from both of them, but nobody actually goes for it. It just laid there for 15 minutes. They're wrapping barbed wire around their arms and fists to hit each other with, but there's a baseball bat that if you were a real man, which apparently neither one of these fucking pricks are, you could just pick up and you could finish this issue in about two or three swacks. But no. More on that later. Uh, They take a bump on the barbed wire boards on the floor. Olivier was down there forever trying to get color. Finally, he got some. But really, they could have saved money at this point and just showed one of Ian Rotten's old VHS tapes because it's a garbage death match. It's the same thing every time. It matters not. Uh, the only thing they missed the opportunity here was they could have had the guy that eats the live chickens uh, be the referee instead of whoever was in the hazmat suit. That could have made it just a little more sideshowish. And then finally, 25 minutes into this interminable fiasco, Moxley realizes there's still a baseball bat laying there and picks it up. And here comes Gallows and Anderson. And I counted, Brian, Moxley hit Anderson six times with the baseball bat, then hit Gallows six times with the baseball bat. <laughs> they weren't down for 30 seconds. And then Moxley got hit supposedly in the head, but the replay showed that it was actually kind of a shoulder chest shot by Twinkle Toes with an exploding barbed wire bat where an effect went off when he got hit with it. And that was a two count. He hit the fucking guy supposedly in the head with an exploding barbed wire baseball bat for a two count. Those words have never been said before in professional wrestling and still haven't because this isn't professional wrestling. And then Gallows and Anderson just come back in and just in front of the referee because it's no disqualification, which, as we all know, as Dan Hausen would tell you, shitty booking, shitty booking, Hausen. Gallows and Anderson help give Olivia or help Olivier give Moxley the one winged fairy onto a chair for a three count because, of course, a one winged fairy on a folding chair is much more deadly than exploding barbed wire baseball bat. And you know what we had left at this point, don't you, Brian? Well, apparently, and I. Four fucking minutes! <laughs> what I was going to say is the commentators also let us know that there's no way to stop the explosion. Yes. Even though the match is coming to a close. The bombs have to go off. There's no way to get around that. There's no way to turn the switch to defuse this situation. We've just discovered that apparently, even though this match just ended four minutes early, the ring's going to blow up in four minutes. Fortunately, everybody had time to leave and plenty of time. Oh, no, wait. This was insane. They went home so early. 
And they've told the people what the time left is. And I think they even showed the clock by this point. They've got to continue to get heat on Moxley, who's selling like he's halfway dead for once. Anyway, he's selling. And they ha- beat him up, and nobody comes out, and nobody comes out, and they handcuff him. And he's and nobody comes out, and they have to go back. And Olivier's mugging for the camera, and then they go back to getting some more heat on him. And then they're taking the barbed wire bat and raking it over his head. And now the announcers, they're it's literally they're beating a dead Moxley. And the announcers say, under two minutes. And Olivier hits Moxley with the bat twice more as they die, twisting in the wind. And finally, at a minute left in Jim Ross's comment, are these guys stupid? <laughs> <laughs> Which he meant they need to get out of the ring before it blows up, but it was perfect at that. Are these guys stupid? Yes. Yes, they are. And they also have no concept of how to time their shit. So finally, the heels leave with a minute left because now the sirens and the gongs and the amp, 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 it sounded like the China syndrome. Some bad shit's going to take place here. This ring's going to blow. Here comes Eddie Kingston, who was the star of the night. He had frantic body language. He was he was in a panic. He was looking left and right, trying to get his old friend Moxley, who they've had these wars, but really he deep down still appreciates and loves their friendship. And he's trying to drag this guy out of the ring because, oh my God, the clock is counting down. Bam, bam, bam. Uh, uh, uh. Woo, woo. it's gonna blow and the fucking announcers take cover take cover and it blows <laughs> and it looked like Gilberg's sparklers on the ring posts a boom from a couple of firecrackers and a puff of smoke and a hearty hi yo we fucked all of you And the ring didn't blow up and the fans start booing and it came off like a popcorn fart. But because they had thought that this was going to be impressive, poor Eddie Kingston, by the way, where was he during the five minutes of heat? Had he already driven out and been halfway home and had to turn around? But he was waiting in the parking lot for John Moxley. Uh, well, I can understand Moxley laying there because they'd beat the shit out of him. He had a reason to sell like death seven minutes into this match. Poor Eddie Kingston covered Moxley with his fucking body. <laughs> and the sparklers went off and Kingston sold like death. He looked like a man who had had a heart attack while fucking his mistress and just slumped over face first and laid there. It buried him. Nothing happened to him. And then to make it worse, they wouldn't get off of it. They had the doctor and the trainer and everybody come in and those guys never got it and they were laying there and they fucking wouldn't get off of it. And finally they signed off. And apparently from what we saw also on Twitter, After they signed off the pay-per-view, Moxley was so embarrassed that he tried to save it by saying, well, at least Omega made a shitty gimmick match. And good night from Jacksonville. You want to play my clip again? That was one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen. I mean, in the sense that I'm embarrassed for the promotion, for the company, for Moxley, for poor Eddie Kingston. (laughs) Poor Eddie Kingston didn't deserve this. I can't even imagine how you can make it more underwhelming. Now, earlier in the match, I liked the match. I know what you think. You just talked about it. Up until the run-in from the Good Brothers, and they should change their name to the Grown Brothers, because every time they're on fucking TV, I groan. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Here because we go. They're, because they suck. I mean, I'm just going to come out and say it. They're not very good. But because they were in the Bullet Club, a I lot like of people... Their, I like their matches. They just have them doing stupid shit just like everybody else here. Well, I don't need to see them 
ever again, but I'm sure I'm going to see them plenty. But they come out, once the run-in happened, to me, whatever the match was building towards, it stopped. I got into it. I was able to lose myself in it. How are they going to end this match? They have to do a big explosion because they promised it. I don't think it's been revealed yet at that point that no matter what, the bombs have to go <laughs> off. There's no stopping them. If the fire commissioner shows up, tough. We have to get these bombs off. <laughs> so I got into the match, and earlier in the match, when Moxley would get shot into the ropes or Omega, I thought that looked pretty good. It That wasn't bad. It wasn't offensive or or really egregiously phony. No, that I thought looked good. So I'm like, wow, AEW did that right. That looked good. This explosion is really going to be something. So then I, I even start thinking like, the people there, are they going to have to like move back from ringside? Is there going to be a lot of smoke? What exactly are I'm, they? I'm, I'm hoping for Jane and Sonny Kiss and a bunch of other people to even lean up on the edge of their seats. Oh, will you one. stop it? Oh, will you stop it? But I'm thinking, I'm like, what exactly does blow up? Like, what exactly is the, what, you know, exploding? What is exploding? Is there an actual item that explodes? I'm really putting a lot of thought into this. Early in the match, they say, you know, the people at ringside, they have to wear flame retardant clothing to be able to sit there. I'm like, oh, wow. Like, you know, they're really serious <laughs> about this. The first signs that something may not be right with the explosion is when Moxley and Omega went off. I think uh, Moxley did his DDT into the barbed wire. Yes. But he was the one who got caught in the barbed wire. Yeah. <laughs> not Omega. It looked like it hurt him far worse than it hurt Omega. But there was no big explosion. I thought if you landed on those boards, there was going to be a big explosion. So it's like, oh, that, that's not good. And then, like I said, once Anderson and Gallows ran in, I just groaned. Well, not man, just because it was them, but because... 16 baseball bat shots to two guys, and, and oh, they're just right back up on you. Yeah. Come on. Shaq goes through a table. He's dead. He's dead and he vanishes. But these guys... And then the handcuffs. I said it whatever, a month ago. I'm sick of handcuffs in wrestling. And they go for the handcuffs. And also, just... see, he, here's the thing. They handcuffed his hands behind him. How did that keep him in the ring that was about to blow up? He could just roll and roll underneath the body. If he was capable of rolling, the handcuffs were not going to deter him in any way. And then poor Eddie Kingston gets in the ring, and I'm like, you know, I hate the finish. I was finally enjoying the match. They ruined it with the finish. They ruined it with the excessive beatdown. But, you know, at least we get this nice storybook ending of, you know, feud of the year, Eddie Kingston and Moxley. Eddie Kingston comes, sacrifices himself to save Moxley. I don't know how that and worked. And he really did look panicked. He was yeah, like, oh, he my was God, great. there's nothing else to do. He, you said it before, he may have been the MVP. He did everything he needed to do right. And he's there. And I'm sure everyone has seen it by now, but it was a couple sparklers on the ring posts. And then it was like just a couple. I got been the 4th of July parties that have been more impressive than that. <laughs> Legit on Long hey, Island where the cops I've are patrolling. A, I've had a couple of arguments around the house here that have been more <laughs> exciting than that. And all this happens. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. And you hear the fans, it's not as uh, audible as it is on some of the fan footage I've seen, but the fans start booing. Well, that's because they turned the crowd mics down as soon as they really, because it was start. It, it rumbled low at first, and, it, and as they realized that's what it was, then it got bigger. And poor Eddie Kingston is selling it like he's dead. <laughs> he's selling it like everything has exploded everywhere near him, and he is dead. <laughs> So, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about Tony Khan's explanation in a moment, but when they try to pretend like this was the intended result, no, the fact that the commentators weren't in on it and Eddie Kingston sold this like he died means that that wasn't the intended result. You actually thought there was going to be a big explosion. Yeah, and no, nobody's buying that hogwash excuse. This was three hours and 45 minutes of... If you gave an amateur class at any wrestling school a big budget and said, do what you want, here it was. It's, it's shameful. Well, that was AEW Revolution, like you said. 
hours and hours and hours of wrestling yeah. entertainment. Hours and hours and hours. I know where they got the revolution name from. That's what the fans that want to take up arms. Instead of storming the Capitol, they're going to storm Daly's place. Jeez, but it couldn't be as dangerous as Daly's place already is with all those kidnappings and assaults back there. Do you want to hear? I have some audio here. I was about to say, I, I want to hear Tony Khan attempt to weasel his Rick Moranis looking face. Oh, you out can't of say this. that. You can't say that. What? He doesn't look like Rick Moranis anymore. If you remember the early days of AEW, or if you ever see footage of or photos of him at one of the soccer matches, he has his glasses, he has a suit, thin tie, you know, very professional. He's now completely disheveled. He looks like a madman. He's dressed like a slob. He's not wearing his glasses. I don't know if it's because of the contact lenses or if he's just fucking high. But maybe he, he maybe he doesn't want to see this clearly. But he doesn't blink. Like he so he just has wide eyes open as and his hair is all over the place. He but looks now wait like a, a minute. Mess. Now wait a minute. A lot of people would take issue with you. They don't believe that Tony Khan went into this with his eyes wide open. How about with his wide eyes open? Maybe that. With his wallet open. How about that? With yeah, with wallet wide open. There you go. <laughs> Einar, Rocky, all of you. Uh, so, with eyes and wallet wide open. So this video's out there. I don't How know do you if, weasel out of it? I don't know if all the quotes are there, so I'm going to try to pull up the quotes in case he doesn't cover it all. But again, here is a rather disheveled looking young Mr. Khan Talking about AEW Revolution, I'm going to press play. Now, now, can we play? We can play. It's a press conference. It's a press right? conference. For the press, we can play this. It was a conference for us, and we're reviewing it, so we are covered. Go. But uh, someone who sent it to me said that the answer is covered within the first couple of minutes. So let's play this. All right, Tony. Uh, great pay per view tonight. I was wondering if you could give us a status update on John Moxley and Kenny Omega, their condition after the match, how everything went. Both guys are great. Uh, you know, uh, honestly, I'm glad neither guy came out with a serious injury because it was a really oh, scary Jesus. match, and they both really put their health at risk for a huge pay per view main event. Uh, I think it was it was awesome. It was a great spectacle, and I think we're all lucky uh, that the bomb going off at the end didn't really hurt anybody. That Kenny's big uh, master plan that he that he built a dud, which I think who would have thought when he drew up the big plan with crayons that maybe the mom might not fail to fail to take both guys out. So uh, I thought that uh, the, the, for the battle, it really delivered uh, excellent action. Both guys came out. Okay. Which is great because on paper, it looked like the kind of match where somebody could get hurt. So there's part of his explanation. Wow. Wait a minute. First of all, you know, they're fine. They're okay. Yeah. Moxley, he just got beaten with a baseball bat and handcuffed and pummeled by our world champion. and two large accomplices and was beaten with everything and stuff. He's fine. And blaming the heel for making a bad gimmick. You know what, Tony Khan, the heel used to be able to take heat like that. When the heel would say something on television and the promoter would get in trouble, he'd say, Oh, it's that daggum heel. We can't control him. Or when the heel would cheat and win a match, the promoters trying to be baby faces would go, well, it's the heels fault. And when people believed wrestling, that worked. But now that you and the rest of your ilk, I don't care whether you've got $1 or a billion dollars, you're nerds living out your fantasies while you're playing pocket pool in your mom's basement, booking your live action action figures that your daddy bought you. It don't work that way anymore because all of you insipid little twerps have told people over and over that wrestling is all fake and funny and bullshit. So now you've got to own up to your fucking mistakes instead of blaming it on the heel because that don't work anymore because you fucked it up. And I wonder if all the Rick Moranis comparisons are the reason why all of a sudden he's drastically changed his appearance. But another quote from Tony. He's probably not able to, to get to the high quality Adderall anymore. And he's, 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 he's doing the cheap shit. But at the end, I don't know what people really wanted unless you wanted us to actually explode the guys at the end. There's only so much you can do. So without actually blowing the ring and blowing both guys up, I think the basic explanation is 
Kenny's ring was set to explode, and his plan as a heel who built this thing with a hammer and nails, as we saw, the final Ugh. bomb just didn't go off. Nobody believes he built it, because for one thing, when they saw him with the hammer in his hand, everybody realized he'd never done a day's work in his life. Nobody believes he built it. And yes, what did we expect? We expected what you told us was going to happen. The ring was going to blow up. This fucking idiot Moxley, this balding sack of shit from Cincinnati, with a fucking emaciated frame and the idea in his warped mind that he's somehow some big badass that people should be afraid of because he snaps necks and breaks legs, even though he never does any of that. And Harpo finger fuck that made his biggest name in Japan sticking his finger up other men's asses in wrestling matches and having contests with sex dolls. We, you imagine the twi the two of them together can't come up with a winner of a goddamn gimmick match? No, you said you were going to blow these fucking people up if they weren't out of the ring. Do we expect you to blow the ring up and the people up? No. That's why we expect you not to have the stupid fucking match where you have to promise people that you're going to blow up the ring and the wrestlers in it. It was a stupid idea that wasn't going to work. I predicted it. Everybody else that knows what they're talking about did too. It didn't work, and y'all should be ashamed of yourself. Instead of coming out and apologizing and just saying we're too stupid to do this, and we have these wacko outlaw garbage deathmatch ideas from these idiot outlaw mud show wrestlers I've signed, and I apologize for all of them, and we're going to start having matches as soon as I can sign some wrestlers. Instead, he blames the fucking heel for coming up with a bad gimmick that his promotion advertised for weeks as something that it was not. Bait and switch, false advertising, bullshit, the inability to follow through with something, and it's the only possible way to paint this in a good light is if they thought after the fact that they'd announced this, this is the stupidest thing we've ever done and we shouldn't do this, they should have pulled the whole goddamn match, but instead they go through and half-ass it and don't deliver what the people were told they were going to get when they bought the thing. Fuck you. Could have just owned it. When ECW tried to do this in like 93, I think it was like either October or November of 93, and it was a dud, they owned it. They apologized. Yeah. They said it was a stupid thing. They won't do it again. You could have just come out and said, yeah, you know, we, we had the best intentions at hand, but it didn't work out. We're hey, never going to do that to our fans ever again. Those early Ring of Honor pay-per-views, internet pay-per-views that went off the air. I came out and apologized and, the and sincerely and explained we were trying to grow and the people bought it. And then Sinclair stopped me from going out and apologized. They said, don't apologize. Concentrate on the good part. The good part of what? The show was off the fucking air. Well, what do they expect for $9 a month? Fuck you, office boy, Greg. And then when I couldn't go out and apologize anymore and they kept fucking up, part of the reason they didn't want me to apologize was because they kept fucking up. And it would have got old because they wouldn't stop fucking up. The same situation here, only they're not on Go Fight Live. They're in, on Mount Adderall with their fucking ADD ridden Booker. Allegedly. And they keep fucking up. Allegedly. And let me just, you mentioned it earlier. So Wait a minute. Allegedly Adderall or allegedly ADD? I think we can prove the ADD. He's well, all over the fucking place. We don't know what medication for sure. But you brought up earlier the clip that's gone around again. Thankfully, these fans are starting to film stuff in Daly's place, so we could see Shaq running away from the ambulance with Jade, and we could see the post-match celebration, as it were. So Moxley gets on the mic while Eddie Kingston's being attended to by whoever, because he's dead from the yeah, explosion that never yeah. happened. How the, how the fuck Moxley had been beaten with baseball bats and all this stuff and gone through this whole match and bled and got blown up. Kingston ran in fresh as a daisy and got blown up and nothing touched him. And he's dead and Moxley's back up on the microphone. Maybe Go they'll ahead. say like Eddie's like an old woman. Like he, you know, or he's like, you know, uh, Fred Sanford. Like, oh, my heart, my heart. 
<laughs> he I'm, just he was so I'm nervous about Elizabeth. it he had a heart attack. <laughs> I'm coming, Elizabeth. I'm coming to the big ring in the sky. So here's the quote, the exact quote from Moxley after the show. Kenny Omega may be a tough son of a bitch, but he can't even make an exploding ring worth a shit. I've seen more dangerous shit on ridiculousness on MTV. What the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they named their show Dynamite and they had no dynamite. They had no dynamite. <laughs> if brains were dynamite, they couldn't blow their nose. Well, all right. You know, Jim, a lot of people at home, and this happens sometimes. They may want compensation for this. I was going to say, I remember in the old days of a pay per view would cut off early, all of a sudden you start hearing. I want my money back. You yes. start hearing that from lots of people. Bob Myrowitz had a big problem with the UFC where it cut off early one time. Yep, and he had to yep. refund a lot of money. But with this AEW pay-per-view, we were promised an explosion and we got a popcorn fart. If only there was a way, maybe you know a way, that some of the viewers at home can get some compensation. I can tell you a, a a fine way because folks, it would have been even better if this pay-per-view had gone off the air without showing the ending, but instead it did. And we were baited and switched and our money was taken away under false pretenses. And for that or any other type of legal situation, there's only one place to turn. Call Steven P. show or two goes to the rest yes folks if you have a legal situation if you've been harmed and you need compensation then you will applaud the services of stephen p new at newlawoffice.com 888-692-8084 you will applaud the great stephen p new because he will tell whoever has wronged you to kiss his legal ass <laughs> And then he will extract from their pocket numerous pictures of dead presidents and hand them over to you, and you will go happy into that good night while your opposition cries like babies because Stephen P. New will have triumphed over injustice and unfairness to deliver to you the proper compensation that you deserve for being wronged and, uh, and trifled with by these major corporations that want to bait and switch you for some reason or other. Newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Get even. Call Stephen. For heaven's sake, call somebody. Get on the telephone and call somebody about this, this fraud that was perpetrated on us all. Stephen P. New, newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Kiss your worries goodbye. <laughs> Well, Jim, we have run pretty long with this review, so let's get a few questions in. The and then show a song. did too. The show ran very long. Let's get a couple of questions and a song. This question was sent in to corny drive through at gmail.com from Booker Teat in Boring, Oregon. <laughs> is that the town or a description of Oregon? Man, this guy has sent in questions before. Every time I read the name Booker Teat, I laugh. I don't know why. I read online that WWE is allegedly telling wrestlers not to use the leg slap anymore. According to some reports, there has been mention of fines being dealt out if any wrestler does this, as well as signs being put up near gorilla position saying not to do this. What does Jim think of WWE giving out fines for doing leg slaps? Also, can Jim think of another time where signs were put up near gorilla position where it tells wrestlers not to do certain moves. Oh, good God, yes. I, well, I at OVW, I had a sign for several things right at the entranceway before they would go out into the ring because of commission rules, can't swear on the microphone. Um, if there's any accidental blood, bring the match to a close. 
uh, and various th- and you had to remind some guys pile drivers were an automatic disqualification, no pile drivers. If you're running an angle like that, that, that uh, somebody is being, one of the heels is running crazy with pile drivers or some type of hold, you don't want anybody else to do it or move or whatever, you put that up. But yes, there's always something to remind guys if there's something specific going on or a new rule change or something. But the fines I highly uh, am in favor of because apparently that means that they've been telling these fucking weasels and telling them over and over and they're not listening. Because they don't start just automatically, okay, anybody does this from now on, we're going to fine you. It's because almost every experienced trainer that I have ever known hates the fucking leg slaps because, uh, again, they're overdone. When Chris Adams was the only one doing a super kick and he did it and he was so smooth with it, you couldn't tell he was doing it. Okay. When every fucking body does it on every goddamn strike in every match in every promotion on every show, it's ridiculous. You know what I just saw? And I don't remember if we ever saw this when we were watching NXT, but apparently, so it may have been before that or after that or during it, I don't remember. But Tommaso Ciampa had some kind of problem with, uh, what's the name of the... The guy who had the mask and he took the mask off and he formed a little group around him. Santos Escobar. Yeah, oh, Escobar. Yes, in the lucha suits. And I guess he was, I believe it was Escobar, and he was kicking his flag. So he put it in the corner by the turnbuckle pad on the bottom rope, and he was kicking it, and then he ran to the other side of the ring to come back to kick it, and he did the thigh slap. Again, it's one thing if you're kicking flesh. Oh, my God. It wouldn't make any noise if you're right. kicking a flag. A flag, yeah. not a face. <laughs> and, you know, once again, it's something that a few guys were able to do and did it well. Bobby Eaton's punch sound effect. You couldn't, you couldn't fucking pick up on how he was making it. There's a few guys that could get by with doing a few things like Adam mentioned, Adams, etc., and then everybody starts doing it, and suddenly, even even when strikes miss, they make this movie sound effect like that, and you're, you're seeing through it. If it wasn't such a constant thing, it wouldn't be a problem. But as far as finding, as I said, every trainer I've ever talked to pretty much hates that shit, and I'm sure it's been mentioned, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Now they're going to find guys, because they can't stop doing it, because they can't for whatever reason, figure out any other way to do things except the way that everybody does them. So I'm, I'm all in favor. Of what? Who was it? Um, who was it? Made the, it was Randy Orton, made that snide ass comment to one of the boys about uh, leg slap class when he was uh, sniping at some of the NXT guys. I'm just just lazy. If there's a sign up at Gorilla. That means it's gotten on Vince's nerves. Oh, yeah, definitely. There wouldn't be a sign on Gorilla at Grill if it wasn't on Vince's nerves. No other thoughts about the banning of get, thigh slaps? Get on Vince's nerves all you want, you jack-offs. He's got the last <laughs> laugh. I'm just telling you. And it used, the same thing 25 years ago, Vince hated when a guy's in the corner and you're choking him with both hands around his neck and he's got his hands on the top rope. You've seen that, right? The guy's in the corner with his hands on the top rope being choked or being punched. And Vince, he would see a tape of that, or he would see uh, the monitor in the back, and he would go ballistic. Look at that, because, and rightfully so, if you're back backed into the corner and the guy's choking you with his hands around your fucking throat, you would have your hands on his wrist trying to pull him off. Or if the guy had you in the back trying to punch you, you would be trying to cover up, which is why we especially always used to, to teach in any training class. When you back up in the corner and the, the referee is breaking the hold or whatever, the heel's backing up, if you're covering your face, he should throw a gut shot. When he throws the gut shot, you hold your stomach. That's when he can hit you in the face. Boom, you grab your chin. He kicks you in the gut, bends you back over, so you're trying to cover this shit up but he's staying ahead of you or other guys will just be back there and they'll be punched in the 
face five times without reacting or moving their arms because the guy punching them is also calling a spot and they got to listen to that. So backing a guy up and just bam, 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 bam. And he's not selling and your punch doesn't work. And, and it's just blah. Cause you're calling a spot. When you break the hold, bam, gut shot. I'll shoot you off. Bam. Shot in the face, tip up and over. Bam, come off the ropes. Bam, I'll fucking power slam you. Call the spot in between the goddamn blows because you need to slow down anyway and let the guy register them. But anyway, that was Vince always has picadillos, but in a lot of cases, he's right. It's just that things get under his skin and he goes specifically with them. In verbiage, a lot of cases, and the words he doesn't want you to say, he's just, it's his. It's his craziness, but in all the insanity that Vince has promoted, still sometimes, for whatever reason, basic things about basic wrestling drive him crazy, and he wants those to look more legitimate in the midst of this fucking craziness that he promotes in the Firefly Funhouse you know, universe that he's got going on. He still wants the goddamn choking in the corner to look good. So there it is. Our next question, Jim, sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Jake in Denver. On a fairly recent interview with Chris Van Villet, I think, the Young Bucks said one of their remaining goals is to be considered the greatest tag team of all time. When asked who they think currently <laughs> holds that honor, without hesitation, Matt Jackson said the Hardy Boys. He continued by saying the Hardys are the top money drawing tag team that ever existed. Now, wait, what? This can't be real. Matt Jackson said the Hardy Boys. He continued by saying the Hardys are the top money drawing tag team that ever existed. Okay. What is your assessment of the Young Bucks claim that the Hardys of the Hardys place in tag team wrestling history? And what are your thoughts on. The Young Bucks delusional idea of eventually being regarded as the tag team greatest of all time. Well, I mean, I understand why to them, the Hardys would be the greatest tag team because they've emulated them and uh, themselves and patterned themselves kind of after the Hardys, even though the Hardys had height and more talent. Um, but I, I, I'm just, I'm not even sure if that's supposed to be a rib or they just thought that, you know, that, that nobody would know any better these days or whatever. But even Matt and Jeff would not say that they're the biggest money drawing tag team of all time because they're not even fucking close. Um, so greatest of all time is subjective. Some people would say the road warriors because they were along with probably Rocca and Perez, pretty close to the biggest money-drawing tag team ever. Or some people who like the baby faces might say the Fantastics or the the uh, uh, the Rockers or the Rock and Roll Express, or some people that like the heels might say the Midnight Express or the goddamn, you know, uh, Heart Foundation or whatever the case, but... I, you know, I understand them saying, well, to us, the Hardys were the greatest tag team of all time, but it's ridiculous to say that they were the best box office team of all time. And, and they've never even said that. And nobody else has either. So I don't know where he's going with that. Yeah, it seems a bit delusional and nuts. It is funny if... And then we say of all time, I just mentioned just 80s guys that they might have some frame of reference of. But I mean, then you're talking Bockwinkle and Stevens and you're talking the fucking... Graham brothers and the Fargos and the Funks and whoever the fuck you so no the Hardys are not the greatest tag team of all time and if, even if the Bucks think they are and that's not knocking the Hardys because look at the competition I just mentioned many names and definitely not the best box office team which would come down to would you not think the Road Warriors or Rock and Perez yeah and the Road Warriors also had merch money well, there you go, which is even better than fuck you money sometimes. Rock and Perez really weren't selling merchandise. Road Warriors had t-shirts, had well, figures. I was, just, I was just going on, on ticket sales also anyway. Well, I know. I th well, 
I think it'll be Rock and not, Perez. Not the money that they made, but the money they drew. Yeah, Rock and Perez first, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we got a few questions about this. This is pretty interesting, Jim. It ties into something we recently talked about. Have you been following this lawsuit, Bill Nye the Science Guy and Disney? No, actually, I like Bill Nye the Science Guy, but I have no idea what you're talking about now. So this might be good. This is fascinating because it may affect you. Okay. Like I said, several people sent in this specific article from Ringside News by Felix Upton, if that is indeed his real name. WWE might have to start paying Legends royalties for streaming on WWE Network is the headline. WWE Legends don't get a check from the company because of their footage on the WWE Network. A new court ruling might set a very interesting precedent Mm. for that to happen. Bill Nye filed a lawsuit against Disney after they started streaming his show on Disney+. Plus. The science guy believed he was owed 50% of the royalties made from those streams. Disney argued that they should only give 20%, saying that this was streaming and not broadcast. It was said that streaming is the natural evolution of home video. Disney won the case, but in that ruling, the judge made a very interesting decision he ruled that streaming content is the progression of VHS and DVD. That could eventually come around on WWE if some legends who had clauses in their contracts for home video royalties Hmm. want to press it. This is a new situation and nothing has been done on the matter. It does open the door to possibly revisit the idea of WWE paying legends for the footage that they stream, WWE's billion-dollar Peacock deal, could help them pay people who have not seen a dime since the WWE Network's launch. I think I like my cock deal better than their peacock deal. Uh, that is, hey, follow the science. Good old Bill Nye. It, it, that only makes sense. Think about this for a second. Regardless whether you're talking about wrestling or any form of sport or entertainment where the talent involved in a a television or movie production or whatever, or something that's going to be distributed on video by some means, if they're supposed to get royalties for VHS and they're supposed to get royalties for DVD, then as you as the judge just said, the natural progression of VHS and DVD is now streaming into your home on your home screen or your phone screen. So why should you not get royalties on that? Just because it's harder to fucking do the bookkeeping? Well, that's not really a good excuse. There ought to be some method in play where you figure out how much is fair to give the talent that has, uh, for what you are doing now that has actively and effectively replaced home video by VHS or DVD. It's still home video. It's just a different form of it. But they're not paying Jack. And Jack wants paid. It's very interesting, because Bill Nye wanted the royalty rate he had for TV broadcasts, which was 50-50. And the judge is the one who actually said, no, this is VHS and DVD. Stephen P. New... Maybe something to look into here. Well, yeah, because that's it, it, I can agree with the decision that it's not television by the by the you know the it's not in the television genre. It is in the home video genre, and there was royalties being paid just at different amounts depending on whose contract and what line of work and etc. But it still should be subject to royalty payments. They're making money for streaming it. So if they're making money for streaming it, why aren't the people that are in the stream making the, the the people that are in the stream are getting pissed on? Now they're making money for licensing it. Yeah, I mean, you know, pretty soon they'll be able to show your home movies on fucking on the internet and you won't be able to do anything about it. That's why I say that they have done everything possible to discontinue making stars and just have interchangeable cast members in wrestling. It's it's Ridiculous. Jim, this next question, possibly our final one. We'll see how it goes. 
sent a corny drive through at gmail.com from Mackenzie Wilno. My Will, question, Will, Willie? Mackenzie Wilno. That's what I'm at. Will Mackenzie know? My question for you is, what are your... Th- <laughs> Sometimes you say something so dumb it cracks me up. Well, I can't even read just it. Just asking you. My question for you is, what are your thoughts on Rick the Model Martell? He was always one of my favorites, and I feel that he is underappreciated when it comes to remembering great in-ring workers. Uh, Martell was, especially as a babyface, you know, a very good worker and a, and a, a, you know, a top guy. He was, he also could heal because he had the French Canadian, you know, cockiness going on. And I mean, the, the model that was what, that was late eighties WWF when people started getting for that, what, seven, eight year period, everybody had a, an occupation model, (laughs) garbage man, plumber, whatever the case. And they didn't really focus on him or use him on top, but Vern had enough confidence in him, use him on top. Um, he, of course, was huge in Montreal with all, all the rest of the, the French Canadian guys, the Rougeaus and Bravo, et cetera. Um, he was a great looking guy. He had good size. He was very good in the ring. It just, you know, it was his main run as a top guy came in the early eighties before a lot of home video and before word got out. And by the time he got to the WWF, he had, you know, one of those middle card gimmicks. Sure. He made good money there, but he had a middle card gimmick and wasn't really featured. And didn't he have, what did, um, well, he came what out of friend? tag teams. Well, that's that's true. They they used him as a tag team first up there before he was uh yeah before he was the model. Him and Zinc as the Can Ams. Okay, boy, that there you go. Him and him and Zinc, and then Zinc flamed out. Yeah, and they made it Strike Force him and Tito Santana, and they were pretty popular. And then he turned on Tito against the Brain Busters at WrestleMania Five. And then I believe it was somewhere after that in the summer, maybe he became the model. Yeah. And I mean, they were trying to push him as a heel and take off on the, you know, like I said, the obnoxious French Canadianness, but they didn't use him as a top guy. And that's where that first eighties run was beginning to cool off a little bit and he wasn't figured in. So now it's been 30 years and a lot of people just, you know, unless they're the really devoted Fans that search out YouTube stuff or go back to the territories, they don't see a lot of him. You don't bring him up anymore. I don't mean you. I mean, the royal you. Nobody brings him up anymore. So it's one of those things. I'm sure they they still love him in Montreal. He was still really good in the ring into the late 90s. Yeah, I mean, he was always in shape and looked great and was a good worker. It just, you know... It just didn't didn't happen in a, a wide variety. When he was in the AWA on top, it was they had seen their better days. Yeah, plus and, by that point he had a bowl cut. And I don't care yeah. who you were. No <laughs> top baby face is getting over in 1984 with a bowl cut. <laughs> oh, he had some good covers of the wrestling news, though. He was very <laughs> photogenic. Well, this will be our final question. All right. Sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com. From Johnny Fisterbottom in Hampton, Virginia. Johnny Fisterbottom calling in again, writing in again. I haven't heard of him in ages. Being the historian... He he used to hang out with Phil McCracken. Being the historian that you are, I want to know if you could remember the first person to reverse the figure four by flipping over and reversing the pressure. And do you think that killed the move since everyone basically could reverse it at that point? Okay, Brian Last, tell me if what I'm about to remember from the deep recesses of my mind with your savant-like wrestling history knowledge is correct. Wasn't it a program between Johnny Valentine and Cowboy Bob Ellis, at least that made the magazines where that Ellis came up with the counter for the figure four back in the early 60s? Was that where it was first noted most prominently i'm not sure because where my mind went was i don't remember the details but i was thinking did tim hornbaker cover this in the buddy rogers book 
that it was something that Buddy started doing. That's an idea. And golly, there were so many good tidbits in that book. But I don't know because I say I, I seem to remember a magazine article. <laughs> it may have been an early wrestling world, or it may have been a, a early '60s wrestling review because. Um, Valentine and Ellis had a feud that was fairly high profile at that point in time. And I think at that time they were using a figure four and Ellis reversed it. But that. It, and the magazines would never lie. Well, no, but it, here's the thing is I'm saying that was pro they were acting like that this was a new thing. If Buddy Rogers had been doing it, they wouldn't have acted like it was a new thing. I'm just wondering. But it, it, the answer to the question is nobody's ever going to know because the first time that somebody did something, they may have just done it on the spur of the moment. And it, whether it's reversing a hold or doing a move or saying a thing or whatever, and then it might come up that somebody remembered that that was on the card or on the show and saw it and is figured in in another territory and that situation comes up, hey, we could do this. And then it actually gets noticed because it's it's intended beforehand rather than something that just happened. You know, who was the first person to use a foreign object in a wrestling match? We've got now, we've got uh, uh, newspaper uh, clippings and results and research from Amarillo and Tennessee and all those places that Scott Teal has done that that was going on in the 1930s. So there's no way to really tell who did the first anything it's just whoever finds success with a move or a hold or a gimmick or whatever kind of becomes known for it and then other people steal from them because they're successful there's really no way to tell what who was the first to do almost anything you're usually good with wrestling physics explain to me how the reversal of the figure four hurts the applyee of the uh, figure four because apparently, and actually there is some d degree of this, of course, if, if you got the figure four put on for a shoot on you, you wouldn't be able to turn it over. But the, the straight leg, when you're in the figure four, the straight leg that is on the bottom, that your other leg is being crossed over at the knee, supposedly the straight leg is the one that's getting hurt because you're being hyperextended and you're, and also it's fucking up the ankle that's crossed over it, but it's hyperextending that knee. Well, if you turn over on your stomach and you do a push up, then you have much more straightening strength in that leg and you can use it to then bear down on the, and the pressure is reversed because it's a mirror image and you're cranking against the other guy's fucking leg, supposedly. It helps with a visual aid of people in the ring and blah, 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 and you showing the hold and the pressure points and everything for people to understand that rather than just verbally. But it's like trying to explain to somebody how to put a fucking Indian death lock on. You can't do it verbally. You have to show it. With that, the drive through is closed. <laughs> Are you just doing a sound effect to counter mine, or was that in I'm, response to I, mine? I'm just, I'm countering and commenting. Close us up, Johnny. Of course, the Jim Cornette Experience debuts Saturday, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Get access to the archive. Every episode of the drive through any experience from the beginning in 2013. Right now, we are uploading shows from the summer of 2016. The most recent batch included Jim's Talk with Jim Ross. Hear that today? Patreon.com slash Did Cornette. anyone say anything that they would be buried for in 2021? No comment. Find out by becoming a patron today for only $5 a month. Patreon.com slash Cornette. Of course, you can go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette to access the official Jim Cornette channel. Subscribe today as we approach 200,000 subscribers on our march to a million. Get access to full episodes, clips of episodes, omnibus collections, all with the very popular and exclusive Travis Heckle artwork, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast. 
at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Cornets Collectibles at jimcornet.com. What is it, a week away now, right, Jim? Less than. Less, Less this Sunday, March 14th. Figures or no, we will open. But if uh, if the slow boat from China docks, we'll have figures. There you hear it, Cornets Collectibles. Let's see how fast you guys crashed a website this time. Stop it. Of course. I bought more server. I've got an extra box of server in the garage if I need some more. The drive-thru is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until Saturday, on the experience, and Tuesday, next week, right back here on the drive-thru. For Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!